Here's uh, us, it's not Alexander, he's a little bit younger. But. <laughs> so <clears throat> as we think about the book of Acts and what uh, what has gone on from this book, let's see. All right. The reason that we are all in this room today is because of what happened 2,000 years ago. Because of the faithfulness of those who had received the Spirit, they have Pentecost, their faithfulness to go out and to listen to what Jesus had said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, to go and be his witnesses to the ends of the earth, that the reason that we are all here today is because of their faithfulness. And the book of Acts is such an amazing book because it inspires faithfulness to anyone who reads them, right? To see how they had been faithful at the very beginning to go out and take that message. And then to see it, our role in the same place of taking that message ourselves to the rest of the world, those who have never heard of it. And the thing I love about Wyoming Honolulu is the um, push and focus to the nations, those who haven't heard, those um, who have never received the word of God. And that we get to be a part of basically Acts chapter 29. You know, this book ends in a place where everything kind of just seems like happily ever after, right? Acts chapter 28, and Paul preached the gospel for two years to anybody who came to him, and he had a wide open door, right? And you're kind of like, okay, well, great. What's next? You know, so what, right? And our response should be that so what, right? To look at Acts 28, and it kind of leaves you in the place of wanting more. And the wanting more that Luke builds in us is that desire then to be a part of the story, right? That each of us would then become part of the story of the book of Acts and would carry on that message as well. But the message in the book of Acts and the whole moving of this book is not just by the will and desire of the apostles and the disciples, but by the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit really is the one that is moving the book forward. He is kind of the central player in the book of Acts, and at every twist and turn and development of the church, it's really the Holy Spirit that is the one moving the story forward and fulfilling the words that Jesus spoke to the church in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that the uh, gospel would be preached in um, in Jerusalem and then in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, right? That is the progression of this book, And then we'll see kind of how it unfolds. But it is at each one of these moments that you see the Holy Spirit is the one prompting it, right? The the ministry in Jerusalem is prompted by the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The ministry to the rest of Judea and Samaria is prompted by the Holy Spirit's leading of Philip in chapter 8. The leading of the church to go out to the end, quote, the ends of the earth uh, in their perspective happens and begins in chapter 13 where there's a prayer meeting in Antioch, and they all are prompted to send Paul and Barnabas out. But the ministry of the Holy Spirit doesn't start in the book of Acts. It starts in the book of Luke, right? And this is something that's quite significant for Luke's perspective. And most people will call it Luke's pneumology, which is the study of the Holy Spirit. And he looks at the work of the Spirit really beginning even before Jesus was born or conceived. Right? The work of the Holy Spirit starts right in Luke chapter 1. And that is where you see the work of the Holy Spirit progressing through life of Jesus and in the church and on down into our lives today. And while the Holy Spirit is mentioned 54 times in the book of Acts, he is mentioned 17 times in the book of Luke and really helps us to see how the Holy Spirit plays a huge part in not only the ministry of Jesus, but then the expansion of the church. And where... Jesus had said in John to his disciples, it's better that I depart from you so that I might send you a helper. Luke really highlights that point, that it was better that Jesus departed because the Spirit was the one who was prompting the church and ministering to the masses, much more than Jesus could have done as a single human being, the Holy Spirit leading the body of Christ in that way and and what will be referred to as the Spirit of Jesus. And so, what I, what I would suggest to you guys that kind of can help you in this is every time you see the Holy Spirit mentioned in the book of Acts, just mark it with a special color. You know, I don't know if you color in your Bibles, but um, I do. 
And I find that helpful to see where the Holy Spirit's really coming up and how he's spoken about in this book. And so that's what uh, this is all about. And then <clears throat> the Holy Spirit will expand the church by various means. Um, it is not always just by the, uh, the going out and efforts of individuals, but it is also by these supernatural happenings. You think of Paul in Acts chapter 16, where he's going all throughout Asia, um, this region here. Paul's going all throughout this region, this kind of purple line, um, and nowhere is receiving, right? Just closed door after closed door after closed door until he gets to Troas and he has this vision. And that's where he's going to then go over to Europe and to Philippi and um, Amphipolis and Thessalonica, Berea, all the rest. And that's, uh, that's a leading by the Holy Spirit. And so as we come to the book, I think a, a good question for us to reflect on is, how, how do we see the Holy Spirit's activity in our day-to-day -day lives? Because for the church, it wasn't just these supernatural happenings and moments that the Holy Spirit showed up, but it was at various times, just in everyday life, that the church is working with and being prompted by the Spirit of God. And sometimes we can only relegate the Holy Spirit to either times of worship or times of gospel preaching or um, times of prayer in our own lives. But it's good to step back and reflect of how is the Spirit leading and guiding us throughout our day-to-day -day life? And are we sensitive to his leading in those ways um, as we start this book and come to it? So what are some of the things that stood out to you guys from the book of Acts as you were reading yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. No, so true. Yeah, and we'll highlight that point when we get into some BRI stuff. Yeah. Um, I thought it was interesting, like a lot of the apostles and, and just different times of like signs and wonders that they were like in the name of Jesus. Mm. You know, like that seemed to like really be prominent. It's like, yeah, of course, that was awesome. Yeah. So. Yeah. Totally. Anything else stand out to you? It seems like the Gnosticism. Yeah. So Paul's testimony. Yeah. yeah, it's repeated three times. It's get kind of boring the third time here. We've heard this before. Good, that's a good observation. You know, even so, you guys, <clears throat> so, even what might feel like the simplest observation is really significant when it comes to the Bible just because the authors are so selective. Yeah. So that's, it is a really good observation to notice that. We'll talk about why that is in here in just a minute. But yeah. Any questions that you have? Why did this happen? Or what was going on here? This is kind of random. Mm -hmm. And I don't even... I may be reading it wrong, but um, in Acts 1, I think it's verse 13, um, it's listing like all the different like disciples, and uh -huh. it brings up Judas mm. right, at the end. So what is the timeline of all the Judas stuff? Yeah. <clears throat> so we will um, talk about the, the disciples now when we get into chapter 1, so that's a good question, so that I know kind of where yeah. we're at, because, yeah, I'll make sure to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So, in previous passages, it talks about how Gentiles don't need to be circumcised because it's like this whole thing where it's like they don't need to be under the law. Mm. But then in chapter 16, it says that um, I think it, yeah, Timothy has to be circumcised, but he's a Greek, so I don't really yeah. understand the, like, why can these people are not under that. Yeah. Could you imagine? It's like Timothy, like, right, Paul comes and says, hey, do you want to come with me? We'll get you circumcised. And they go to the next synagogue, and Paul's, like, reading the letter to the church. And Timothy's like, wait a second. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that for sure in chapter 16, probably tomorrow, uh, because that is a, it can seem be a very confusing story um, up front. So, yes, we will talk about that for sure.
Okay. Well then, we'll, if you guys have questions as we go along, um, please do ask them, um, and we can always take time for questions. So, let's, uh, let's look a little bit at the literature of this book, okay? Because we wanna look at the Book of Acts inside of its historical context well, to set this book up so that we know what type of book we're reading and what to expect out of this book. Okay. What did Luke think he was writing? So let's uh, take a look at these two passages the introductions to Luke's writings. So maybe, <clears throat> Riley, can you read uh, Luke 1, 1 through 4 for us? Uh, and as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. You mind reading slowly? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Absolutely. I want us to be able to listen, listen to it well, okay? Just really uh, take, it, take it in. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainly concerning the things you have been taught. Great. So... We get some important things about Luke's kind of mode in writing, what he has uh, been researching, who he's talked to, how he's organizing his content. Okay, so the reason we, we start with Luke 1, 1 through 4 is because Luke has that in his mind when he's also writing Acts. Okay, so he, he's, his expectation for every reader of Acts is that they've already read Luke. So that when they come to this book, they have a good grasp of what Jesus was already doing, of how Luke was already writing, and an expectation of what uh, what they should get out of the book of Acts in light of what Luke wrote in the first his first writing. Okay, so <clears throat> do you mind reading Acts 1, 1 through 2 for us? In the first book of Luke, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, and after he had commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Okay. Oh, you, uh, could you read also verse 3 for us? Yeah. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many fruits, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking of the kingdom of God. Okay, great. So what, what Luke does is he doesn't remind Theophilus of any of the things that kind of set out this story, right? I didn't, he doesn't mention eyewitnesses. He doesn't mention being there. He doesn't mention anything about that because he already has that expectation. Okay. But what we see from the beginning um, is his meticulousness, right? his concern with history and accuracy, chronology, very clearly expressed in the first introduction, okay? which then should be how we understand this book. So when Luke writes, what he's writing with these two introductions is a very common format for how historical writers would introduce their writings in the Greco-Roman world. Okay? So it is not outside of... Luke's historical context of what he is writing, he fits very well inside of other historical writing kind of genre of his day. And what that means is that there is going to be an inevitable bias in his writing, um, and that there will be intentional exclusion and omission of certain things for the focused intention of uh, his writing. Okay, so you won't obviously get all the things that you want to get out of it, and so we will often get an incomplete picture of what was happening, but we are getting the picture that Luke wants to present. <clears throat> and when we understand that all history is biased, every single history book ever written is biased because every human being is biased to some way, in shape or form, then we can read it with a sense of comfort knowing that his historical accuracy um, is not being diminished by his bias in how he's trying to present and what he's trying to present, okay? So when we think about the purpose of this book, then that can help us in seeing, okay, how is Luke biased in his writings? What are the things he's highlighting? What are the things he's emphasizing? And that will obviously emphasize the purpose for us. With Luke as a person, um, who I'm just going to assume right now is the author of this book, um, we see a high, highly educated style in his writing. Uh, Luke writes some of the most complex and elegant Greek in the New Testament. He, his writing style um, to introduce characters, to have speeches and fluctuation in writing. The fact that 
acts is so engaging from beginning to end. Even in the travel narratives, when you read chapter 27, it's like even that's action packed, right? Um, it feels like it gets a little dragging at the end, but even in those stories, Luke will still keep us engaged. And so his writing style is very clearly seen. This is not something that Luke just threw together uh, in an afternoon, but took a lot of time composing and organizing, editing, rewriting, until it came to its final draft. And he, of course, is wanting to um, get, get us into the, the mindset of the people, not only of the apostles in the church, but also into the mindset of those in Athens when they're listening to Paul and how they're thinking, um, to the Jews when he, uh, Paul comes before the Sanhedrin. Um, all of these scenarios um, throughout the book, what Paul or what Luke does is he sets up his readers so that no matter who they are, they have the essential historical context to understand the situation. And so the nice thing about Acts is that the most important pieces of historical information or background are right there in the text already for us. So <clears throat> that serves any reader at any time. Now, <clears throat> with Luke... In, uh, in his writing, we see a lot of parallels with how he writes this book and then the gospel. So there are clear parallels, not only between um, the world and the organization of the geography of these books, but in the characters that are talked about. For example, we see a lot of parallels between Jesus and Paul. Okay? The, the trials, the people they stand before, um, kind of their lifestyle, we see their treatment and engagement with crowds, both acceptance and rejection. We see both of them on trial. We see both of them speaking to, being confronted by or rebuked by Pharisees and Jewish leaders. They both have disciples. They both have some kind of physical trade. They both grow in kind of this wisdom and stature. And so there's this parallel there between the, the two of them, not in a way that makes Paul any kind of deified figure or diminishes the um, messiahship of Jesus Christ, but to parallel these books together. So Luke does this as a, a way of pointing towards Paul and the validity of his ministry. So some of these things would be like the tribunals in the Sanhedrin that both Paul and Jesus stand before these near the end of the books. Okay, So the farther along in the books we get, the more clear this parallel becomes. And then of course, the Roman procurators that both of them stand before and the Herods that both of them stand before. <clears throat> Beyond that, there is a clear emphasis and focus on Jerusalem. Uh, there is a clear connection between John the Baptist in both of these writings. And so Luke is not just, of course, writing a flippant record, but is composing a beautiful work of literature. <clears throat> with that in mind in the parallels what we see then is this kind of climax point so <clears throat> the book of Luke I don't know if David might not like me doing this but um, the the book of Luke moves towards Jerusalem. Okay, you have this kind of everything heading in that direction. So it kind of starts there with Jesus and his baptism. Um, sorry, Jesus and um, his dedication at the temple when he's a baby. Uh, and all the first few chapters surrounding Jerusalem. And then a lot of his life in the early chapters is looked at in Galilee. And then from chapter about 9 or so, we're going to move towards Jerusalem. And then Jesus is going to arrive in Jerusalem. And when he arrives in Jerusalem, then the happenings of the book of Luke from about chapter 19 all the way through Acts chapter 8 are going to be happening in Jerusalem. Okay. And then we're going to move this progression out to Judea and Samaria in Acts 8, and then ends of the earth. And that takes us out. So... Luke looks at the 
city of Jerusalem is this kind of crescendo moment. It's where everything climaxes in the book of Luke, and it's where everything is sent out from in the book of Acts. And you'll notice a lot of things happen around Jerusalem. So even though these things are going on, Paul is still going to make his way back to Jerusalem. And so this is, it's quite an important place for Luke in his writings, just because of all that's happening there, the early church, the decisions that are made. Um, but uh, that helps us kind of see Luke's pattern and where he is sending things out from. So Luke writes more than anybody else in the New Testament, as far as amount of text is concerned. Uh, he writes 27% of the New Testament himself. So between those two books, he wrote over a quarter of the New Testament. And he writes the two longest books in the New Testament. Both of these books, Luke and Acts, would have taken up an entire ancient papyrus scroll. Both of them would have been 35 feet long, which would have probably stretched across the front of this room and all the way to the back. It is a very long scroll, and what should stand out to us then is that Luke is not just writing to fill up a bunch of scrolls and he's trying to write down everything he knows. He knows exactly how much space he has to work with. And because he knows exactly how much space, and because these two books fit almost precisely on an ancient papyrus scroll, then we know that everything that Luke included was for a purpose. He did not include anything by accident. He didn't include anything because, oh, I just need to fill some space and I'll just add their names in here. And instead of typing the numbers, I'll just write them out longhand. You know, Luke wasn't just trying to fill that space. So with that in mind, we must pay attention to the use of repetition. When things are repeated in Luke and in Acts, we really should pay attention to what is being repeated, how often, in what length, is it repeated? Is it stated once very long and then condensed? Or is it repeated and then expanded each time it's repeated? The interesting thing between these books is that no words of Jesus that appear in Luke also appear in Acts. Okay? He reduces words and topics where he's already brought something up and then expands things where things have been brief before. But then things to pay attention to, like was already mentioned, is that Paul's conversion is repeated three times, and in each successive repetition, it is increased in length. So by the time you have him testifying before Herod Agrippa, it is the longest testimony of Paul's conversion that you've had yet. And so you want to ask the question, why? Why is this repeated three times, and why does it get longer each time it's repeated? <clears throat> The Jerusalem decree is also repeated three times in this book. But each time it's repeated, it's condensed. So you have it very long in chapter 15, then you have it short again in verse uh, 29, uh, twice in chapter 15, and then in chapter 21, it's repeated again, and this time in only one sentence. So why is this repeated multiple times in this book? What's the purpose of it? <clears throat> And like a good Greek writer, what, the, what Luke will do is he will introduce you to a character before they actually come on the scene. Okay? So if you think about Acts chapter 12, do you remember whose house Peter goes to after he's freed from prison? Good, Mary the mother of John Mark. Who's John Mark? Why do we need to know that it's Mary, the mother of John Mark? We don't know who John Mark is. So there's no point in saying that unless he's going to bring up John Mark in the very next chapter. Chapter 13, John Mark now comes with Paul and Barnabas. And so Paul, uh, Luke is going to introduce these type of things. Or you might have this example. At the end of chapter 4, there's a man who's very generous who goes by the name Joseph, but also is called, you know, Barnabas, right? So you have Barnabas already mentioned in chapter 4, but he's not going to come up until chapter 9, okay? So these type of introductions that, Paul, that Luke is going to give to his characters in this book, or you have the same thing with Saul at the end of chapter 8, or uh, end of chapter 7, eight cha or 8 chapter 1, I think it is. Um, 
Saul was standing, watching over their coats, approving of the execution of Stephen. Well, who is this guy? We know nothing about Saul. And then he's going to come up in chapter 9. So that's good Greek writing. It's kind of like you're watching a TV show and there's a cameo of a future important character that's going to come on the scene. And then in the next episode, they're going to become the main character. And so Luke will do that. Uh, and it's good Greek writing style so that when they come on the scene, you're familiar with them. Oh, yeah, I know that guy. I, I know a little bit about him. He's been here before. The next thing that is significant for our understanding of Luke's writing is that 90% of his vocabulary in this book comes straight out of the Septuagint. So Luke, as a writer, is not just this Gentile guy, but he is steeped in his understanding of the Old Testament. Now, maybe that came after his salvation, um, maybe before he was a God-fearer, somebody who um, was in a synagogue but hadn't decided to get circumcised yet, um, but we know that he's counted among the Gentiles in Paul's writings. So how he has this vast understanding of the Old Testament, we're not really sure, but it's very clear in his writing that he uses and um, integrates the Septuagint into it very, very clearly. Now, the last thing I want to hit on with the literature here is just to talk about this idea of the speeches. Okay, the speeches and acts are very significant. In fact, when you're looking at narrative, the dialogue in narrative is going to often tell you more about what a person thinks, believes, than what the narrator will tell you about them. A dialogue is the most important aspect of narrative when it comes to the teaching points or the morals from narratives. Okay? So what does the dialogue tell us? Well, the dialogue in the book of Acts, we find that one quarter of this book is speeches. Okay? That's a very large portion. <clears throat> now, in the ancient world, when speeches are recorded in historical writings, the authors of those writings were not trying to reproduce the speeches verbatim. Okay, so they weren't going back to recordings and writing them down longhand or anything like that. It's not like somebody sat in front of Alexander the Great and said, okay, stop there and writes things down. And Alexander speaks and he writes more down, you know. The, when Xenophon, uh, a Greek historian, is writing these speeches in his historical writings, how do they know what was said at those times? Well, we go back to Luke chapter 1. Eyewitnesses, keepers of the word, right? The people who you can ask and say, what was the tone like? What was the setting? What was the atmosphere of the people? What were the main points of uh, what was spoken? What was the communication like? What was Peter's emphasis? What was Paul trying to say, right? Those are the type of things that the, uh, that the authors of the historical books would be asking about these speeches. And so what Luke would then be doing is taking eyewitness accounts and reproducing those speeches. Now, the nice thing Paul, uh, with Paul is that Luke probably traveled with him quite a bit. We see these we passages coming up in chapter 16. So Luke probably got to listen to Paul a lot, right? And so the speeches that he reproduces of Paul are probably quite characteristic of Paul. When he talks about Peter and reproduces speeches of Peter, we know that he'd be able to talk to people who were there listening to these speeches at Pentecost, um, or in Jerusalem in the early church. So he's able to gather evidence for these speeches in his writing so that he's accurately producing what the speaker has said. And this is not seen as a distortion or plagiarism because major, uh, majority of the people who were there were still alive. And that's Paul's call to his witness of Jesus' resurrection in Acts chapter 15. Hey, if you don't believe me and what I say, just go to Jerusalem and ask them. Just ask all the people who were there and saw Jesus resurrected. So when Luke is writing these speeches, it's not like he's distorting the words of Peter. He's taking the eyewitness and saying, hey, if you don't believe me, just go talk to somebody who is there. And <clears throat> probably one of the main ways that Luke reproduces the speeches is around the verse references that were used or the Old Testament topics that were talked about. And what you see is that none of the speeches are the same. Even when Peter gives a speech in Acts 2 and then again in Acts chapter 4, the speeches are completely different from each other. Right? The topics of conversation. And then Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7, very, very different. 
And even while Paul gives a synagogue discourse in chapter 13, and he uses the same verse references that Peter uses in Acts chapter 2, the topic of the conversation is completely different. Okay? So Luke is very, very precise in what he's trying to communicate and reproduce here. And the amazing thing is, is that while Luke is authoring this whole book, he can write two different speeches for two different characters, and they are so different from each other, right? Peter sounds nothing like Paul, uh, sounds nothing like Stephen, and so on, right? So it's quite, a, quite an interesting aspect of ancient writings. <clears throat> the one uh, kind of protest that people have had about the speeches of Paul in the book of Acts is that none of his speeches sound like his letters. So when Paul speaks in Acts chapter 13, and he speaks in Acts chapter 17, then he speaks to the Jews in Acts chapter uh, 22, and then 24, and uh, 26, then, or sorry, uh, yeah, 26, then none of these speeches sound like Paul's letters. You don't open up Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, uh, or Thessalonians, these four that are clearly undisputed letters of Paul, and none of them sound similar to what he says. But what must be recognized is that all of the speeches of Paul are given to non-believers, except for one speech in Acts chapter 20, where Paul is on the beach at Miletus, and he's speaking to the Ephesian elders. And when he speaks to the Ephesian elders, there is more similarity between that one speech and Paul's letters than all other speeches combined. Okay, so... That one speech to Christians helps us to understand that what Luke is reproducing is a lot of Paul's evangelistic ministry and not necessarily his church mentorship. By the time that Luke writes this book, Paul has probably written at least 10 of his 13 letters. And so he has a good idea of what Paul would write. He doesn't need to reproduce that in the book of Acts. So we've been mentioning Luke a lot. But let's talk about the authorship of this book. <clears throat> now, the books of Luke and Acts are effectively anonymous, just like all the other Gospels in the New Testament. <clears throat> but there are, of course, things that we do see in them that can help lend an understanding of who the author is and what we know about them. With the author's characteristics and what we've highlighted from Luke chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, and then his repetition throughout the books and the literary style is that he is meticulously accurate with his details. Luke is incredibly intentional. We do know that he was with Paul at certain portions of his ministry travels. We see these um, in these passages here, Acts 16, 20, 21, and 27. And that with Paul, in these travels, he would have been witness to many, many things, but also would have had access to written documents. Okay. So that is probably one of the main ways that Luke is able to reproduce certain things. So when Luke has this letter of Claudius Lysias that is sent to the governor Felix, when Paul has this assassination threat on his life, Luke writes that down exactly as it came. Right? Probably because he was able to have access to that letter and can copy it down. Or the initial letter to Jerusalem is probably the one that Paul then carried when he went around to the other churches. And so Luke is able to reproduce that quite specifically. So he would have had eyewitness um, experience with a lot of the events and also written documents that he would have had access to. And when we think about the traveling companions of Paul listed in Acts and also in his other letters there are a couple notable people missing. The, there's, of course, people like Demas, who's missing, but the, the, um, the two most significant are Titus and Luke. Okay. Titus is really uh, a significant figure for Paul. Titus is one of the most important people to Paul's ministry. In fact, Titus is the one who Paul sends when times are tough with a church and he needs some reconciliation to happen. He sends Titus... When um, the church in Crete needs elders placed, he sends Titus, or he leaves Titus there to take care of that business. Right? So Titus is quite an integral part to Paul's ministry, and so it is very, very surprising that Titus is absent from all but Paul's letters. 
if he was such an important disciple, and he's referred to in Titus as a true child, then it's it's quite interesting that he is missing from these letters while Timothy is in, or missing from Acts while Timothy is included. But just as much as that is the absence of Luke, the fact that Luke is not with Paul in any of these writings by name, at least, is quite significant considering the fact of his importance in the book of Colossians and also in 2 Timothy, where everybody else has abandoned Paul, but Luke is still there with him. Okay, so that is uh, some significant absences for these two characters. But in light of this, the early church tradition has held Luke to be the author of both Luke and Acts. Okay, so uh, that is where tradition lies. It's what has been held from the very beginning that Luke, the physician, this traveling companion of Paul, was the one who wrote both Acts and the book of Luke. <clears throat> we see these as early as 1 Clement, where there are potential allusions in the text to the book of Acts, and also the Didache, which is an early 2nd century document uh, for the church. And then in the 2nd century, we begin to have direct quotes. And so the earliest identifiable direct quote of the book of Acts is by Justin Martyr, who was um, alive and then writing near the end of his life, between A.D. 130 and 150. And then, of course, a plethora of references in later writings, including the Muratorian Canon, or the Muratorian Fragment, and the Anti-Marcionite Prologue, which are um, two collections and writings in the early or in the mid second century, and then many other church fathers, which we could go on and on about. By the end of the second century, there is no debate over the authorship of Luke and Acts, and it is only into the age of criticism, about 250 years ago, that there begins to be questions about the authorship of these books, but very um, speculative at that. What is interesting to consider about Luke, in light of all that we've talked about already, is that Luke is the only Gentile author in the Bible, as far as we know. <clears throat> and so the fact that a Gentile, the only Gentile, is the one to write the most content of the New Testament is quite fascinating to me. I think it is a, it's just a testimony to what God was doing in the first century and within those years of the writing and composing of what would become the New Testament that uh, Luke would stand out so strongly. <clears throat> All right, any questions on any of this stuff so far? All right, so let's look at the dating really quick. You guys had Mark last week, right? So... Um, did you guys place Mark in about 65, 66 or so with the fire of Rome? As far as dating goes, is that when Jonathan was suggesting it? Or did he suggest an earlier date? Before the fire of Rome? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Because um, they're uh, like in the 40s, or sorry, 50s? Yeah. In the 50s? Okay, perfect. Um, I think that's a, a very good way to date the book be honest. Um, there's been a, a lot of connection with the book of Mark and the fire of Rome and the persecution of Nero, and I do think those are valid suggestions. Um, but I do think the book of Mark probably came earlier. Um, and there's a lot of those who think that because of the fact that <clears throat> Mar that Matthew and Luke, did Jonathan talk about the um, that, uh, gosh, the synoptic problem? Okay, so Matthew and Luke definitely use Mark. There's, there's really little to no disagreement on that. Um, and for that to be the case then, that really determines when we will date Luke and Matthew, right? So if Mark comes early, then Luke can also come early. Um, and what most people notice in the dating of the book of Luke is that there are certain events missing from the end of this book. For example, the discussion of Paul's freedom. Paul is not released from prison. It just says he was there for two years. There's no mention of the fire of Rome or the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, some significant events in the church's timeline. As well as the fact that by the time that, the, that Nero begins his persecution, Christianity has now become known as this kind of superstitious contingent of Judaism that should be singled out. 
right? Simply because of the way that Nero's highlighting it. Now, violent persecution was not spread throughout the empire. That is something we know for sure, only in isolated pockets, usually of some kind of mob violence. But Christianity became recognized uh, as this kind of um, offshoot of Judaism and this superstition. And so by the mid-60s and then into the late 60s, um, there is a very strong confrontation of Christianity in the Roman Empire. And then the Christians begin to kind of stand strongly against the Roman Empire more. But in the book of Acts, what you see is that there is such a strong testimony to Christianity's validity by Roman officials that the people who acquit Christians most often in a court of law are the Romans. The Jews are the ones who are condemning it. And so with the attitude of the Romans in the book of Acts, it's very likely that Luke is writing the book of Acts before the fire of Rome in 64 AD. And so um, that's some, some uh, just fuel to the fire there for when to date this book. But yeah, there's some important dates missing. Um, this should say, sorry, the late 60s, not the early 60s. Um, and then some will suggest then the writing of Luke in the 70s or 80s if Mark is written in the 60s. So if Mark is written during the fire of Rome, then Luke would have to be written much later, <clears throat> probably in the 70s or in the 80s AD. And then Mark, uh, Acts would, of course, come after that. But if Mark is written earlier, then Luke can come earlier, and then the book of Acts can also come earlier. So when Luke writes at the beginning of the book of Acts, or book of Luke, that he's interviewed eyewitnesses, keepers of the word, these type of people, right? When would Luke have had the time to do that? We think back to the we passages, right? Luke traveled with Paul to Jerusalem, right? And then where does Paul get stuck for two years? Caesarea. Luke is still with him. And so those two years provide a great opportunity for Luke to gather eyewitness accounts, to interview people, to talk to people. Mary, the mother of Jesus, probably still lives in Galilee, or at least in Jerusalem at that time. And it's been suggested the reason that Luke has such precise birth narrative account, where none of the other gospel authors have that, is because he probably interviewed Mary and talked to her. Right? So these type of things would have provided him a, a good opportunity, and that would have been between uh, 57 to 59 AD, those two full years that Paul is in prison in Caesarea. But the latest possible date that we could have is the end of the first century AD. And so really, the, the dating will depend on your dating of the book of Mark, but I do think that a dating sometime in the early 60s between or around 60 to 62 AD for the book of Acts, I think is a fair date um, and should have a lot of consideration. Now, who who's this book originally written to? When you think about the readers of this book, who is Luke writing to? We're gonna write at the beginning. Theophilus. Theophilus, okay. so. Who is Theophilus? And what do you notice different about Theophilus in chapter 1 of Acts and chapter 1 of Luke? Why don't you take a look there? This is most excellent, Theophilus. Most excellent. Good. So by the time Acts comes around, Theophilus is no longer excellent. Now what happened? What happened to Theophilus between Luke and Acts? Who else is called excellent in the book of Acts? Paul calls a couple people excellent. It's near the end of the book. Felix and Festus. All right, they are both called excellent by Paul. Most excellent Felix. So what is then significant for us is that if Luke 
uses the term most excellent in his writings, then they're probably being used in the same kind of context or in, to a parallel situation. So if that is the case, and we only see the uh, only other person being referred to as most excellent as a Roman governor or procurator, then maybe Theophilus is a Roman official. And that his post or position could have been uh, finished between the writing of Luke and the writing of Acts. <clears throat> So that is a possibility here simply because of the title usage, but some people won't look at that as uh, evidence enough for that and would rather think that maybe Theophilus is Luke's patron. So in the ancient world, writing was very expensive. Usually it would have to be undertaken by a very skilled person who was trained how to do it. Okay. Now, a lot of people who had gone to school could read and write. In fact, the Jewish people of the ancient world were some of the most literate people. On average, 95 to 99 percent of Jewish boys knew how to read and write. Okay? So it is not something uncommon, but what you see about Paul is that he was not trained in writing. Galatians chapter 6, he says, see with what large letters I write. Now, that isn't because he's upset. He's like, just look at how big I'm writing. I'm so angry, right? It's not like cap locks, okay? He's, uh, he isn't trained to write like a scribe in small, precise letters that are consistent with consistent lines. Um, and I don't know if you, have you guys seen like what an ancient manuscript would have looked like at all? As did, I don't know if Jonathan showed anything like that. Let me just pull up a picture real quick, just so you can kind of see. Because writing in the ancient world was a very precise task and would have taken a lot of skill. Okay. So this is an ancient uh, manuscript at the end of the book of Luke and the beginning of the book of John, written on then. So this is from a codex, and a codex is a book that is bound usually with some kind of um, metal ring or some kind of binding together with leather or something like that, and then it was like a book instead of a scroll. Okay. And so you have uh, Luca the end of Luke and the beginning of John. And what you can notice about this is all the letters are uniform, right? It looks like it's been written by a typewriter except for some minor ink errors, right? But it's really consistent, okay? Um, with your average everyday person, they're not writing like that, okay? And so that being said, having the job of putting together a book like Luke and Acts would have taken a lot of time and money thinking about writing that meticulously for 35 feet. Organizing this book, what stories am I going to include, what words am I going to use, what transitions am I going to make, this would have been an incredibly in-depth process. It's not just sit down and type an email type thing. And so what Luke would need then is somebody who's going to sponsor him. And so some people have suggested that Theophilus is his patron, or we would have used the word sponsor. Right? He's going to pay for everything. He'll pay for his travels, he'll pay for his food, he'll pay for his lodging, anything he needs, plus all of his supplies. Now, writing process took a long time um, because of the editorial drafts. I think probably Abby will talk about this next week in your kind of epistle seminar, but, or the, yeah, the letters. But um, <clears throat> the writing process of things would have taken a long time. For example, the book of Romans probably took at least three months or so to write. Um, Paul's letters would have not just been sat down. Even Philemon would have probably taken a couple days to put together um, because it goes through a lot of editorial process and rewriting. So Luke's writing would have been uh, quite in-depth. And so a patron is somebody who is suggested as that possibility. The uh, other suggestion is that Theophilus is just a pseudonym for the church because the word Theophilus, which... Um, it means, it's a compound word of theos and uh, phileo, uh, or philos, and uh, it means loved by God or beloved of God, or can mean friend of God. 
And so some people say that this could be just a pseudonym for the church as the friends of God or the beloved of God. But the downside to that is that doesn't distinguish which God. There were a lot of people in the ancient world named Theophilus. It was a very common name in the time of Paul. And they didn't mean Yahweh. Right? We say the term, we say the word God, and we think the God of Christians. But Theos is just a general term for any God. And so Theophilus is just a way of saying loved by a God or could be loved by the gods. You know, so there's a, a variety of ways of referring to this name. So it doesn't have to necessarily mean that. And the reason most people don't think this is because there is no uh, existent examples of it being used inside of Christianity. So. But the way that Luke writes and the historical background he includes, the accuracy of his writing, the intentionality that he has uh, just goes to demonstrate that Luke is um, writing for a very broad audience. And so he's, of course, writing for Christians in the first century to know, but he's also writing for anybody down through the ages to be able to engage with his work. And so we can sit down and read this book, and we don't need very much historical context to understand it. There's things that help us give insight and understanding, but the book is pretty straightforward. But if you're wanting to interpret from a very specific readership idea, then I think Theophilus is a, a good guy to go for. Um, as Luke is either giving thanks to him at the beginning or he's writing to him. Some people have, have suggested that maybe Luke and Acts are even an evangelistic tool for Theophilus to come to faith. Um, but even that is debated. So there's not really a, a clear agreement on Theophilus as a person. So I think Christians throughout that period fit really well. <clears throat> okay. So let's look at a little bit of a timeline, and then uh, that may take us towards our uh, first break here. So <clears throat> when we look at the timeline, Acts covers about a 30-year period of the church. So that goes from about Jesus' resurrection and ascension in 30 AD or so um, until the imprisonment of Paul in Rome, which will last between 60 and 60 or so and 62 AD. Okay, so it's about a two-year imprisonment, but we give it a three-year period just to be safe. Um, and through Luke's writing, he's going to key you into summary statements that kind of break up this book into five-year segments. And so each time you see this summary verse coming up, you will know that, okay, Something is kind of concluding, and Luke is transitioning into his book. In his book, so um, these are going to be like Acts chapter six, verse seven, where it says, "And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith." Or Acts chapter nine, verse thirty-one, which says, "So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord." In the comfort of the Holy Spirit, 1224. But the word of the Lord increased and multiplied. And these are going to be those, those key summary statements that, key, that uh, help you to see the uh, transitions in these five-year increments. <clears throat> One thing that makes Luke quite unique is that he is incredibly historically accurate with the terms that he uses. And this is one of the things that 250 years ago, people were using to dismiss Luke as an author uh, writing in the first century because he gets things wrong. Okay, they, they suggested that the titles that he, that he gave or the people that he gave were imprecise or incorrect. Okay. But as um, archeological digs and excavations took place in the 1800s and early 1900s, the inscriptions that were found only served to testify to Luke's accuracy. So a number of these things. Um, you have him very specific with his references to the people like the Asiarchs um, or proconsuls or procurators. He is very precise in the people that he mentions. 
<clears throat> and gives them their precise titles for their geographical locations right? because they're called different things in different places. And <clears throat> that degree of accuracy helps to validate the areas where we have not found things yet. So for example, uh, Luke chapter 2, at the very beginning of that book, provides some of the, um, some confusing information that people have disagreed upon. Um, <clears throat> sorry, chapter 3. The first paragraph there, it lists all these people and places and times when Jesus is going, um, or sorry, when John the Baptist is starting his ministry. And you, uh, that's what's happening in chapter 3. Sorry, the the one that people are disagreeing upon is chapter two. The first paragraph there, you have the bunch of people listed when Jesus is going um, to be born in Bethlehem at the census that Joseph is taking Mary to. And there's some disagreement on dates in there, when those things are happening. But what most scholars will conclude is because Luke is so accurate in every other area that the areas that we cannot find reconciliation for is our fault and not his fault. Because he's so accurate in everything else, we can take the areas where we're confused or misunderstand to actually be our misunderstanding and not Luke's misunderstanding. So just as a, a point to be aware of in Luke's accuracy. In fact, the interesting thing with Luke is that he is so detailed that if a scholar is interested in shipping practices of the first century in the Mediterranean, Luke, in his Acts writing is the most authoritative ancient author on the topic of shipping in the Mediterranean. He wrote more about the routes that ships sailed than any other author in the ancient world. And so secular historians will go to the book of Acts to find that information. Um, it's so interesting that with Luke's accuracy in writing chapter 27, which might be a boring travel chapter for you guys, is that there are sailors who can take Acts chapter 27 a star map and a compass and can sail the Mediterranean from Caesarea all the way to Malta with only Acts chapter 27, a star map and a compass. And this is how accurate Luke is, is writing, right? So what he is recording for us is incredible. <clears throat> now, a few of the things that are corroborated outside of the book of Acts, we see this famine mentioned in Acts chapter 20, 11, verse 28. That famine will take place in 45 to 48 AD, and is also mentioned by Josephus. And he mentions the procuratorship of a governor, Tiberius Julius Alexander. <clears throat> Herod, the king that is mentioned in Acts chapter 12, verse 1, is Herod Agrippa I. He had received his royal title from Emperor Gaius in AD 37. And uh, Judea was added to his kingdom in AD 41. And his death that's recorded in Acts chapter 12 is also recorded by Josephus in the same manner. Okay, so these two different authors recording this, the death of Herod Agrippa, the first in the exact same ways. Now, when you read Luke's account, it seems like he got up, was praised as a god, and then he died instantly and was eaten by worms instantly, right? But when you read Josephus' account, he got up, everybody was proclaiming him as a god, and then he becomes sick and he dies within a very short period of time. And so Luke and Josephus' accounts are very, very similar in that way. Um, but Luke doesn't say he died immediately, right? He just gives the air that it happened so quickly. <clears throat> the uh, significant event of chapter 18, verse 1, where we read that Priscilla and Aquila were in Corinth because they had been kicked out of Rome in AD 49, is because of this instigation of riots by the Jews. And Emperor Claudius kicked the Jews out of Rome and uh, banished them all to leave. It's only five years later under Nero that they're allowed to come back in 54 AD. But we find that their banishment of Rome, or banishment from Rome, uh, coincides very clearly, Acts 18.1, with Claudius's decree in AD 49, and Paul's presence in the city of Corinth during the time of a very, very important proconsul, Gallio. The reason Gallio is so significant for us is because he's named as this proconsul um, over this province, 
and that corroborates Paul's stay there with and helps us to verify the historical accuracy of Luke's writings. Because there is a inscription found at the city of Delphi, which is uh, around here in Greece, and that inscription testifies to Gallio's proconsulship between July 50 or July 51 and July 52 AD. And so that helps to corroborate these events for us. Finally, one that is, uh, had stumped people for a very long time was that Luke tells us that there was multiple proconsuls in Asia while Paul was at Ephesus. Okay. Um, Acts 19.38, when the, uh, the man stands up to calm down the crowds and the rioting, he says, we have proconsuls. You can go and see them, right, if this is a real dispute. But he doesn't say proconsul, right? Every province or region would have one proconsul. So why does he say proconsuls? Why does Luke make that statement? Well, that, that simple difference of a plural helps us to understand the placement of Paul's time in the city of Ephesus. Because at Paul's, uh, while Paul was there, this, um, the proconsul, Julius Silanus, was assassinated. And in his place, took up three different proconsuls who helped to lead the province until the next proconsul came in. And so that helps us to accurately date Paul's time in Ephesus. So these kind of events give us very clear understanding of where, when things are happening, outside corroboration, and how accurate Luke is being in his writings. The, some timeline of events here to just get some, some stuff for us so you can see these chapters when things are taking place. Right, we have uh, the resurrection, ascension, and Pentecost. Acts chapter 1 is happening in the spring of AD 30, or um, roughly about that time. And then somewhere around 33 or so, Saul is converted on the road to Damascus. And so those opening chapters happen roughly within that time period or so. In 35 is when Paul visits Jerusalem in Acts chapter 9, after he had spent some time in Damascus. And then from Galatians, we know that he spent three years in Arabia before he went up to Jerusalem. So he spent three years in Arabia, uh, and then comes to Jerusalem, and they send him away from Jerusalem back to his home city of Tarsus in Cilicia. And then we don't really hear from Paul for about a decade. In Ten years, Paul's at home. But between that time and 44, the same year that Herod Agrippa I dies, the execution of James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, takes place in Jerusalem. He's beheaded. And then the imprisonment of Peter and then the ultimate freeing of Peter by the angel. 48 is that famine, or sorry, 46, that uh, famine in Judea is taking place. Paul and Barnabas visit and brings the, the famine relief for the people. And then 47 and 48, Paul and Barnabas go on their first missionary journey, Acts chapter 13 and 14. 49 is going to be a significant moment in the book, uh, 49 AD in chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council, which kind of sets this firm moment in time of the transition to the ministry to the Gentiles from what had been beginning in Acts chapter 10, and then we'll go through the rest of the book as the primary ministry to the Gentiles from after that point. Um, Paul and Silas will leave at the, after the Jerusalem Council at the end of chapter 15, and they'll evangelize in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, after they have had in a terrible time closed doors throughout Western Turkey. In the fall of 50 to 52, Paul will spend in uh, Corinth, it's about 18 months he'll spend there. And then we see Gallio's proconsulship, July 51 to June, or July 52, in Acts 18. And then in the summer of 52 to 55, so Paul sails back from Corinth, he goes to Antioch, he'll spend a short time testifying to what God has done throughout Greece and Macedonia, and then he will travel inland and come to Ephesus, where he will spend roughly about three years in the city of Ephesus, from about fall 52 to summer 55. And then Paul will travel through Macedonia and Greece, and then will travel onward to Jerusalem. His third missionary journey is the longest of all of them, as he spends the most amount of time in Ephesus. 
prior to um, his time in Corinth, he was very brief in most of the places that he visited. And he didn't seem like he planned on staying very long in Corinth either until Jesus told him to in a vision. <clears throat> so Paul then, 57, set sails for Jerusalem to try to be there uh, before Passover. And so we know that's in the spring. And then we see that Paul is in custody at Caesarea for two years, and then he'll spend two years in custody at Rome. So that will begin. And you, you have this map here, but this kind of just shows some of the, the roads that people would have taken, um, the shipping routes that we are aware of, uh, the major ones anyways, throughout the region of the Mediterranean. Okay. Any questions over anything we've talked about this morning? Okay. Then let's take a break. It'll take 15 minutes. Is that good? Cool. Sounds good. So, with a lot of the BRI stuff out of the way, we'll just talk about the purpose of this book, and then we will get into the book itself. So, when we think about why Luke is writing this book, there have been basically three primary historical uh, suggestions over the purpose of the book. The first is that of a legal reason. So, the fact that this book gives such a clear positive presentation of Christianity before Roman government suggests that Luke might be writing this book as a court brief for Paul. If you remember, obviously, at the end of the book, Paul appeals to Caesar and then gets sent to Rome. And when you appeal to Caesar, there's only two options, life or death, right? You're either innocent or you're dead or you're going to be killed, right? So... That's why Paul says, I don't fear death, because I know I'm innocent, right, when he appeals to Caesar. And so some suggest, okay, well, Luke is putting together this court brief for Paul so that when he comes before Caesar, he has all of this evidence for what he's preaching, all the history of this movement, that it's not something that is um, disturbing the peace, that the only people disturbing the peace are the Jews, right, not Paul. And so that shows it as this acceptable sect of Judaism and not a separate religion, which the Romans would have been completely unaccepting of. They did not like new things. And so <clears throat> this uh, just shows the, um, the impression of legal protection for Christianity. The next is this suggestion of an apologetic purpose, that Luke is writing to correct certain belief systems of his day. <clears throat> and this could be influenced by the fact that um, his writing style and a lot of historical writing styles are influenced by theatrical writings, so that when you read this book, it's like you could watch it as a movie, right? So historical writings in the ancient world are not primarily for the purpose of presenting facts just by themselves, as much as it is of communicating a story. Okay? And that's what Luke is doing, is he's writing kind of this theater piece and with that, in the ancient world, in these historical writings and these kind of theater pieces, that they are illustrating moral principles, okay? So, or they're trying to prove a point. When Josephus writes his history of the Jews and the war of the Jews, his whole purpose is to justify God and Israel after 70 AD, right? That what, what had happened, right? He's justifying what had taken place. Or you have Roman authors, um, Plutarch and Livy, who use their historical writings to teach morals. <clears throat> or Tacitus, who writes as an aristocrat in Rome for this longing of the grandeur of old Rome. And so what the history does is it sets a theme and a focal point um, in history so that you view that his the historical events through that lens. Okay, so this apologetic approach is trying to bring corrections to belief systems for the people. So that's why there's going to be um, Roman law courts, Greek philosophers, um, Jewish sects, rural Asian farmers. There is all sorts of different people who are encountering the gospel and being corrected in their worldview uh, to how they should think. But beyond this, there is this missional aspect of the book as well. 
<clears throat> that while aside from prayers, signs, and wonders, the Spirit is prompting the movement of the gospel out beyond Jer Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And this is really seen through those summary statements we talked about, how the gospel is going forward and it was being accepted and nothing was able to stop the gospel. And so really the ultimate goal of this book is to inspire people in cross-cultural ministry and communication to bring the gospel out to all people. And that while you have people highlighted as Peter and Paul and Philip, that really the main character of this book is the Holy Spirit throughout the whole thing. And he is the one who's moving the gospel forward and prompting the advancing of the church. <clears throat> now, as we go through the book of Acts and look at each chapter, or pretty much every chapter, I won't be able to hit everything, so if there's something you're curious about or I missed or skip over, then please just let me know and we can talk about that, okay? Um, so when we open up this book, as we mentioned, Luke expects us to have the entire gospel in our minds. Okay, the way Luke writes, he expects that the gospel of Luke is in our thinking so that when we read this book and he opens it by saying that I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit and to the apostles whom he had chosen. Okay. So this, end, or this introduction says, okay, remember everything I already wrote. And now we're going to move forward from that. And so I like the, the title of this book, The Acts of Jesus Part 2, right? because he's the one sending the Spirit. Right? And it is because of his, him sending the Spirit, the Spirit's work in the church to expand it and make him known and preach his gospel as him being Lord and Savior of the earth and the Christ really is what's going on in this book. So the Acts of Jesus Part 2, which then gives us the Acts of Jesus Part 1, being the book of Luke. So this uh, kind of two-part series here. <clears throat> now, at the beginning of this book, we notice something that should be significant, this period of time that Jesus was appearing to his disciples. Okay, did you guys catch how long he was appearing to his disciples in verse 3? For 40 days, right? which should make you think of other 40-day periods of time. Right? So Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness, the Israel's 40 years in the wilderness. Um, these moments in time that were very significant for the beginning of ministry or for the transition uh, between time periods in Israel's history. So Jesus resurrects at the Passover festival on Sunday, right? After, after the Passover, resurrects on Sunday, and then he's going to appear for a 40-day period. And that 40-day period leads up to which feast that takes place in chapter 2? Pentecost. Okay. The, word Penteco the word Pentecost comes from the number of days between Passover and this festival, the Harvest of Weeks, or the, the Feast of Weeks, which is 50 days. Okay. So Jesus appears to his disciples and meets with them for 40 days. So roughly, it is about 7 to 9 days from the time of Jesus' ascension until the day of Pentecost. So it's not a long period of time. They only have to wait one week. Kind of we think they're up in the room praying for like months at a time, right? They're only there for a few days, about a week long. But uh, Jesus appears to them um, for these 40 days, instructing them on what? What is he talking to them about? Let's look at verse 3. So right in that 40-day period, what are the things he's talking about to the church? The kingdom of God. Okay. That's all he was talking about for three years. <laughs> That's what he was talking about. This is his ministry, the kingdom of God. And if you jump back to, for example, Mark chapter 1, verse uh, 34, I think it is. <clears throat> when Jesus is preaching the gospel... Sorry, not 134, 114. Um, 
Now you have Jesus who was, uh, after John was arrested, Jesus came out of Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, also in uh, verse 17. For that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, that Jesus' message is preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, So his message isn't changing now, but it's going to look different. Okay, the, the question we would want to ask then is, what does this mean? What does the kingdom look like? What is Jesus talking about when he's talking about the kingdom? And the interesting thing is that on the day of Jesus' ascension, or it seems to be in the next paragraph, that the disciples' question is about the kingdom of God. Okay, well, Jesus was talking to them for 40 days about this, and finally they're asking a question at the end, where he's like, well, what, when, is, when should we expect the kingdom of God to come? And their question in verse 6 tells us a lot about what they are still thinking about. Because Jesus talking about the kingdom is clearly talking about the inauguration of God's rule, right? That God's kingdom, his value system, his morals, the way he would organize people, is coming into reality, right? It is taking place, it's being implemented. And then the disciples come together in verse 6, so when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They've kind of missed the point. Okay? He, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, and the disciples still think that equals the kingdom of Israel. Okay? And then Jesus is going to go on to give them further instructions. But this makes a lot of sense, because they're still thinking about a political kingdom. Did you guys talk about that in Mark? About Okay, so you know that the people are expecting some kind of political entity. Jesus is resurrected, and they're still expecting a political entity. Now, of course, you would, too, if your leader was invincible. Right? Came back from the dead, of course, right? Now it's the time to take, take Jerusalem back to overthrow the Romans, right? Of course it is. But Jesus, again, is reorient, reorienting them, and that is going to most primarily take place when the Holy Spirit comes and reorients them. So <clears throat> instead of rebuking them, he's going to redirect them to what their ministry is. So would somebody read 1-8 uh, for us? You will receive power from the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria into the end of the world. Okay. So there are two promises in this passage that are given to the disciples. The first promise is that the Holy Spirit would come upon them and give them power. But is this the first time that the Holy Spirit will fill them? At the end of the book of John, after Jesus resurrects, on the first day of his resurrection, Resurrection Sunday, it says that he breathed on the disciples in John chapter 20, verse 22, and they received the Holy Spirit. So the filling of the Holy Spirit doesn't seem to be the first receiving of the Holy Spirit for the apostles, but it does seem to be a distinct moment of power that fills them. And that will happen then progressively throughout the book of Acts, where there are other moments of spiritual filling and power. And so we don't want to look at the day of Pentecost as this day that is kind of the Holy Spirit had never been there before and now he's there because Luke clearly showed us the Holy Spirit has been working and active the whole time. Okay, So it's not like he just showed up on the scene in Acts chapter 2. And Jesus had already breathed the Holy Spirit upon his disciples in John chapter 20. Okay, So just as a theological piece, we want to be aware the Holy Spirit has been at work for a long time already. And so it's not like he's just coming now it's just that he is coming in power. He's going to move in power. The next important promise is that through this power, they will have the responsibility then to be witnesses. So Jesus promises them, you will be my witnesses in Judea or in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so this is a geographical organization for the book. And Luke is keying you in on how the book will move forward from here on out. Okay, so you can pay attention then and list this as, you could even write next to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts 1 through 7, Jerusalem. Acts 8 and 9, Judea, Samaria. Uh, you could probably write until chapter 12, Judea and Samaria. And then from chapter 13 through 28 is going to be ends of the earth. Right? Those are going to be really the focus of this book and how it moves. <clears throat> and that, of course, mirrors the Gospel of Luke like we showed on the board before. 
and this entrusting of the message to be Jesus' witnesses okay, is significant because that language is courtroom language. Okay? It is not just go out and preach on a street corner language. It is going out to be a witness to what has been experienced, to what has been seen, and to testify to, which is also courtroom language, of what they have experienced. Okay, So all of the language that Jesus is using with his disciples is that of the validity and verifying his ministry in a courtroom type setting so that they will be found, whether uh, guilty or innocent, uh, in their message. <clears throat> so the word witness uh, in Greek is the word martus, which is where we get the word martyr from. Um, and at this time, it didn't carry that connotation of martyr, but it will later on. And as Christians go on uh, throughout the centuries, their martyrdom is seen as a witness. Okay? That's the, the parallel idea. So they are called to be martyrs, i.e. called to be witnesses for Jesus wherever they go. And that same call is for us as well, to be witnesses to Jesus. That when we go out... Um, sometimes I think, you know, we use this label of just preaching the gospel to people, but I think like the older term that was used about 30, 40, 50 years ago of going out and witnessing to people um, is much more of an appropriate term, right? Because witnessing to people is, is sharing an experience, not just preaching at somebody and hoping that they will receive, but witnessing to them about what has taken place and what has happened in our own lives. And that's, of course, what... Jesus is calling his disciples to. So from there, Jesus, of course, goes up into the clouds, but this is not some kind of divine holy elevator that Jesus hops into and rides up into the sky. But um, when we look at clouds in the Old Testament, clouds are a common signifier of God's presence. Right? The cloud over the tabernacle, the cloud that came down on Mount Sinai, the cloud that comes at the Mount of Transfiguration, the cloud that fills the temple, all of these moments where clouds come are signs of God's presence. And so when Jesus goes up into the cloud, it's not this image of him just riding up. And at what point did he disappear? Like, was it when he exited the atmosphere? Was it when he got too far that he just looked like a speck in the sky? Like, at what point did he disappear? It's not the point of it. The point is that he is going to God's presence. Okay. Um, and this connects with what we see in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, um, we see this image of the cloud rider, as um, some people refer to him as, is this one who comes on the clouds to the throne of God. And Daniel chapter 7 shows this kind of picture of the victory of the Son of Man and then um, the saints who are then um, being attacked and then the kingdom of God coming and triumphing over the powers of the evil and protecting the saints. So this picture that we're meant to connect is this idea of the Son of Man coming to the throne of the Ancient of Days in Daniel chapter 7. So Jesus coming on the clouds to him. So this term of idea of like coming on the clouds that's used in the Gospels and used at the beginning of Acts is Jesus' ascension or going to the throne, not necessarily his return to earth, right, as it's referred to. <clears throat> so um, Daniel 7.13 is the specific verse. <clears throat> the, uh, before we get into the replacing of Judas, we have listed then um, what was brought up before. Um, at the end of this list of the disciples, Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. Okay? Um, do you remember who the, Judas's designation of the, the one who betrayed Jesus? He was Judas, and his second, Iscariot. So there are two different Judases that follow Jesus. So Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot. Um, and whether Iscariot is a family name, um, i.e. Um, association with his family, whether it's Judas uh, from uh, the city of um, Iscariotu, then you know, it's unsure. But Judas Iscariot is how we translate it. Um, Judas is a very, very common name in the first century. And the reason that most people will kind of change this name is because of Judas Iscariot betraying Jesus. Okay, so it does not be, it's not as popular amongst Christians as 
it was amongst Jews at the time of Jesus. Um, in fact, the, the book of Jude, the name is actually Judas. Um, but that doesn't make for a very good name when Judas is the one who betrayed Jesus. You know, people could get confused as this Judas Iscariot's writing of something. So it's called Jude. So Judas commits suicide, and this uh, account is slightly different from Matthew's account, just to be aware of that. Um, they are slightly different in the details, but not in the big picture. Okay, so both of them talk about this field that was purchased, that Judas committed suicide, um, and that uh, he either broke open or spilled his guts, so there's some kind of happening of these type of things. Now the details, not as big of a deal um, in this. Uh, in the differences in the Synoptic Gospels, did uh, Jonathan talk about the variations of stories, how there are minor detail differences? Have you guys talked about that? Okay. So it talked about how that or validates the story more than discounts the story? Yes. Okay, great. Then I won't bring it up here. <clears throat> but the rest of chapter 1 is devoted to this interesting situation of replacing Judas Iscariot. So why? Why do you guys think that Judas Iscariot needed to be replaced? Okay, it's a good thought. I think so. Yeah, I think that uh, there is this connection between the 12 tribes of Israel and who Jesus was, what he was trying to do, right, in presenting a new family of God. Because a lot of what Jesus is doing in the Gospels, uh, is, or in the Gospel, is a, a recreation of God's family. At the beginning of John, John will say, that this new family is not by blood or by the will of man or by the flesh, but is by faith in the Son of God. And so getting into the family has totally changed. And so the, the new 12 is kind of this reorientation of God's family. Okay? Now, what are the qualifications to have somebody join this 12? Good, they have to be, have been with them from the very beginning, which is quite intriguing, right? Because it tells us that there was a lot of people, or potentially multiple people, who were walking with Jesus outside of the Twelve, who were there from the very beginning. So these two guys, right, Matthias and then Joseph, or uh, Barsabbas, are the, the two names that are changed, which is quite interesting. Maybe Jesus changed their names. Right? Both of them are called by different names. Um, oh, sorry, Joseph is, and then Matthias is not. But maybe, maybe Joseph's name was changed. Um, but anyways, you have these two guys, and they've been around for the whole time. Right? I, I wonder if this other, there's another guy mentioned later on in Acts. Um, his name is Manasseh. And it says that he was an early disciple as well, which could imply that he had also been around from the time um, when Jesus was around. So that kind of idea then shows us that there was a lot more people that were present with Jesus' ministry than we might sometimes give him credit for. <clears throat> and then Luke could be making the connection with the 72 that are sent out in chapter 10, right? Uh, Luke is the only one that records the sending out of the 72, right? Matthew and Mark record the sending out of the 12, and so that obviously gives us the 12, but then 72 shows us, oh, there's a lot more disciples around, of which these two men are probably a part. But how is the decision come to? How do they decide who is to be the disciple? They cast lots. Okay. Now, we don't know if this was rolling dice or pulling a stone out of a bag, which is how it was done in the tabernacle time, or whether this was drawing straws or what it was. But it would have been something along those lines. But what should stand out to us is that this is the last time that lots are cast in the whole Bible. Okay. So what changes? What changes after this moment? The leading of the Holy Spirit. Right? After this time, you never see them casting lots again. You see them instead asking the Spirit of God. 
And so in Acts chapter 10, when, G, when uh, Peter goes to the Gentiles, it says, because the Spirit led me. You know, the decisions they make in Acts 15, it says, because this seemed good to them and the Holy Spirit, right? And so the decisions they make, the places they go, seem to be led by the Spirit of God and not by casting lots. And so it's just an important principle for us, I think, you guys, is that as believers, we probably should not make our decisions upon casting lots because we have the Holy Spirit, right? And we don't need to draw straws or cast stones or put out a fleece because we have the Holy Spirit. Our confirmations don't need to come before our obedience, right? Um, I think one of the, some of the great pictures of, of this is like um, Moses, when, uh, when, he come, when he's at the burning bush and God says to him that, you know, you're going to take these people out of Egypt, and Moses says to God, how will I know? What, do you remember what God says to him? God says he'll go with him, but he says, you will know that it was me when you come back to the mountain. So it's like, once you've done everything, then you'll know I called you. And we're like, okay, I need confirmation before I go across the street to share the gospel. And sometimes the confirmation we need is that once we've done it, we'll have the confirmation. So this is uh, just, I think, an example for us in, in walking with the Spirit the, the relationship that's developed with the Holy Spirit in the church is so much more alive and dynamic and relational than casting lots. And when we see people casting lots in the Bible, it's because they don't have a relationship with God the same way. People like Gideon putting out a fleece. Or here in this sense, they're casting lots and they're not asking the Spirit of God yet. We just don't see that relationship yet in the same ways. So... <clears throat> That uh, I think it's just an important point for us, you guys, is that asking the question of ourselves, how many confirmations do I need before I'm going to be obedient? Right? Um, and am I trying to get God to show himself in some specific way through some confirmation before I'm going to listen to him? Um, most of the time, um, in my experience, it has been the confirmations that come not when I've asked for them, but when God has spoken something, and then he begins to confirm it after I've begun to walk into it, you know, um, that then he confirms it. And so God wants to confirm what he's spoken to us, but he's looking for a relationship with us where we respond before he uh, makes that confirmation. <clears throat> so Jesus, Jesus ascends. Um, this is a Jerusalem for us. Here's the Mount of Olives uh, facing Jerusalem. Um, and the Mount of Olives is actually, elevation-wise, higher than the city of Jerusalem. And so when you sit or stand on the Mount of Olives, you look into Jerusalem. Um, let me show some another picture here for you guys so you get kind of an idea, because I want you to... This is a kind of a grainy picture, but I'll show another picture. So this is today. The, the Temple Mount that stretches from here all the way to about here is the original Temple Mount built by Herod um, back before the time of Jesus. So now it has the Dome of the Rock on it, obviously. Here's a, a, a nicer picture. But the, the, temple, the um, Mount of Olives looks down into the Temple Mount. So when Jesus speaks, remember uh, Mark 13, and the judgment that he speaks over the temple, it says they're sitting on the Mount of Olives, and so they're looking into the temple from when Jesus is giving that judgment upon Jerusalem. They can see the whole city, because the Mount of Olives is higher than Jerusalem. Okay. So, uh, most of the city anyways. <clears throat> so that gives kind of a, a picture for us. Um, if you see, like, reproductions of Jerusalem, um, what you would notice is that this, the Temple Mount is roughly about one quarter of the size of the city of Jerusalem. Okay. This is a little smaller, um, but in other, like, the, there's a, a scale model in Israel, and the Temple Mount is about one quarter of the whole city. So it's really, really big. Okay. Um, this gives a little bit of kind of a conceptualization of it. It is absolutely 
enormous. Okay? Um, hundreds of thousands of people are said to have been able to gather in the courts here around the temple. Right? At like, times like Passover or the Day of Atonement, that they could gather hundreds of thousands of people in there. So it's like sports stadium larger than that, right? Because people are packed into the Temple Mount. Um, at the time of the Passovers, Josephus is estimating that the city expanded by multiple hundreds of thousands of people and even grew to the um, population of a million at certain Passover times. So it is the, the like a, a, Jerusalem's kind of like a loan. Like when it's feasts, it, it expands and is huge. And then after the feast, it really gets tiny. Okay? So when Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost, this is a pilgrimage feast, right? Between Passover and Pentecost, a lot of people have left, right? It got really, 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 really small. And now at Pentecost, the city has expanded again with a huge number of people coming for this pilgrimage feast. So when we open Acts chapter 2, this day of Pentecost is very significant in Israel's history and their, their calendar. It is this feast of weeks in uh, the law, you'll notice, <clears throat> 50 days from Passover, so that's where we get Pentecost from, 50. And this feast celebrated a number of different things. <clears throat> One of the first things was that it was a harvest festival. So, one of the first days that the church really gets a large harvest of souls is at the celebration of the harvest. And then, on top of that, the Feast of Pentecost also is associated with the giving of the law. That between Passover, when Israel left Egypt in uh, Exodus chapter 12, and when they arrived at Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19, is estimated to be about a 50-day period or so. Right? They're arriving in June. So they celebrate the giving of the law at Mount Sinai when they arrived and God made the covenant with them. Why is that significant? Because now God is not writing his law on tablets of stone. Like Jeremiah says, he's writing his law on the tablets of our hearts. And like First Corinthians or Second Corinthians chapter 3 says, is that the spirit is evidence of God's law written on our hearts, right? And so the parallel should be super clear. On the celebration of the giving of the law is the celebration of the Holy Spirit's filling of the church. Jeremiah uh, chapter 31 um, in the book of Hebrews is the longest Old Testament passage quoted in the New Testament. And it is the giving of the law, right? Of the Spirit in the lives of believers. That God is making a new covenant and so, this is, it's so, I mean, so profound because of the meaning of the feast. This was the celebration of the receiving of the first covenant, and now Jesus' blood inaugurated a new covenant at Passover, the same time when the Passover lamb was slain in Exodus chapter 12, now inaugurated a new covenant at the end of the Gospels, and then 50 days later celebrates this covenant being received upon people's hearts as the Holy Spirit. So the parallels should not be left out because it is incredibly important for how we see this. So there's a lot of people from around the empire, tons of uh, pilgrims coming from everywhere, which is why Acts chapter 2 notes, oh, there's so many people who have heard the uh, glories of God in their own languages. <clears throat> and when the Holy Spirit comes upon the church and fills the church, we see a mighty rushing wind. We see fire. And these are both examples of God's presence, right? When God comes in the wind, when he shows up in the fire, right? You think of Elijah, the fire licking up the sacrifice on Mount Carmel, the wind coming and blowing the Red Sea apart so that Israel can cross on the Red Sea. These are, these are Old Testament ways of talking about God's presence engaging with his people. And when you think about all of these nations coming to one place and God showing up to unify them all, how does he unify all of the nations here in Acts chapter 2? What does he do to unify them? Yeah, he allows everybody to hear the same thing. Okay. When was the last time that everybody heard the same thing? Sorry? 
Tower of Babel. Genesis chapter 10 and 11 is the last time that everybody could hear the exact same thing together from multiple nations, from multiple people groups. And so what you have in Acts chapter 2 is a reversal of Genesis chapter 10 and 11. What happens in Genesis chapter 10 and 11? Okay, when you think of the Old Testament story, you have kind of this funnel here. And you have Genesis 1 through 3, which shows us all of creation. And then you have Genesis 4 through 9, which shows us, uh, sorry, uh, 4 through 11, which is a picture of humanity. Okay, so you have all of creation, and then you have a focus on humanity, Genesis chapter 4 through 11. And then from chapter 12 of Genesis, all the way down through Acts 1, is a focus on Israel. The whole rest of the Old Testament is this focus on Israel with small glimpses where you're gonna have kind of a shooting star that comes across the scene, right? A random person, a random people group that's gonna pop up that's gonna be a focus. But Israel is really the resounding narrative for the whole thing. And then you're gonna have this expansion at Acts 2 until now. That is God's choice of all of the nations again. Okay. So, Genesis chapter 11 is seen as the disowning of the nations. Right? Where God confuses all the languages, he sends them all out to their own lands. In the very next chapter, he chooses Abraham and says, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Okay. So it's a major transition. So when you get to Acts chapter 2 and you say, okay, what does this sound like? Well, it sounds like Babel, except in reverse. So you have all these languages now understanding together. And so what is, should that demonstrate to the readers, to us? It should show us that God is choosing all the nations again. It is a symbol of his redemption of all of humanity. To choose everybody to come into the kingdom. <clears throat> Now, this, this uh, begins to come up <clears throat> if you pay attention to um, what Peter talks about in his message. He's going to begin to allude to this idea, even though everybody at Pentecost is actually just Jewish from every other nation. The idea that they're from all over the nations. And then Peter will say the Holy Spirit's being poured out on all flesh. There are so many illusions that build you up to chapter 10, so that when you get to chapter 10 and the Gentiles are included for the first time, all of that should be, oh yeah, that was talked about in Acts 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. And it's just this constant building kind of um, undertone rhythm until you hit chapter 10, where you really get the inclusion of the Gentiles most clearly by the ministry of Peter. <clears throat> so the people are shocked that when they hear uh, the Holy Spirit leading others to speak in tongues of nations to uh, all of the, the people in Jerusalem because there's some people who suggest that they're drunk right? and they say oh it's only the third hour um, this would be 9 a.m. in the morning, and that's why they're laughing at them. So 2.15, if you need an extra note there, 9 a.m. is when it's happening. Quite early in the morning. <clears throat> and Peter's first response to this is going to be to show them how the Old Testament prophets spoke about this event. Okay, so Peter is not going to try to tell them what's happening. He's going to try to convince them that what is happening is God because of what the Old Testament prophets said. Yeah. He's just going to say, you know, this is what's, let me tell you what's going on rather than explaining, explaining the event itself. So where does he start? Well, he, he starts with this, uh, this prophecy from Joel, which sounds a little odd, right? Because some of these things in here just sound like destruction things that are going on, right? You have these last days and 
these symbolic pictures of the sun being darkened, the moon turning to blood, and what's going on with all of these things. So the last days is seen as beginning in this moment. How do we know that? Because Peter's, Peter is recognizing the pouring out of the Spirit. Okay? In the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Okay, so Peter says, if this is happening, then it must be the last days starting now. Have you guys talked about the age of tension diagram? Have you shown that? Not yet? Okay. So, let me... If you haven't, it's still good review. Or if you have, it's good review. So, sometimes when, when we talk about history, you know, there's these two ways of viewing it as this linear thing or it's cyclical, right? Um, the Jews would view history kind of in this way, that it is like a red carpet being rolled out. Okay, so Genesis chapter 1, the whole carpet is there and God kicks the carpet and it starts rolling out. Right? And that's Jewish perspective on history, is it is just a linear role throughout history. And there are significant moments, for example, the giving of the law, that then change everything from then on out. Okay? And then there will come a significant moment where the Messiah will come and set up the kingdom of Israel, and then that will change history from henceforth. And they view these, this linear line. Now, at this point, they, they thought, you know, Israel is going to be redeemed, there's going to be a resurrection, that kind of thing, at the end of the age. And the end of the age then, here, then begins this new age. Okay? So when you have Paul talking about uh, this phrase, this age, and then the age to come, this is the Jewish perspective. Okay? We are all living in this age right now, and then... Once this is inaugurated and the resurrection happens, then there's this age to come. Okay. One of the marking things about that is resurrection. Okay. The resurrection happens, and that kind of is a signal of the age to come having been inaugurated, as well as a bunch of other things. So what happens? Okay. So we have this line of history, and this has kind of happened way back here, but then you have Jesus. Now, the event of Jesus has forever changed the timeline. Okay, right? It has forever changed everything afterwards. Okay? And so what you have is this kind of parallel time. And there will come a time where this age will end. Right? This age comes to an end right here. Resurrection of the dead, return of Christ, setting up of the kingdom. And then, the kingdom of God will go on forever. And so, this age is being overlapped by the age to come. And what we see then is that there are times now where there is death, and there's sin, suffering, all these kinds of things. But there's also healing, and salvation, and uh, God's kingdom invading, and so you have this, this tension then. Okay. So when Paul talks about this age and the age to come, uh, and this idea of the last days, how can Peter say the last days have begun 2,000 years ago? Because what signified the beginning of the last days that I just mentioned? Resurrection, right? And so resurrection is that symbol. So when Paul comes to this realization that Jesus has been resurrected. He calls Jesus the first fruits of what will happen. Right? He says he is the first fruits of what we will become. And so if he is this first one, then he guarantees that all will be resurrected. And when he sees that one person has been resurrected, then he knows that that is a guarantee. And so if one person, that Jesus started this, then this is the beginning of the last days. Okay. So that's this kind of idea there. Now, when all are resurrected, some are going to be resurrected for eternal life, and some are going to be resurrected for judgment. Right? But all will be resurrected. 
And so this is what, what we kind of get, what you're going to see throughout the New Testament. So this is a really important. So when you see Paul say this phrase, that he's been given the name above every name in this age and the age to come, this is what he's talking about. Okay, this kind of idea, the age of, that we call this, this diagram is called the age of tension, that we are now living in the age of tension. <clears throat> so, Peter says the, the coming of the Spirit is a sign of the age to come, that men and women are now prophesying, which should take us back to Numbers chapter 11. Right? In Numbers chapter 11, the Spirit comes down and people start to prophesy. And then in the camp, there's two people, and jo uh, Joshua goes to Moses. He says, there's two people in the camp who are prophesying. Make them stop. And Moses is like, I wish that everybody would prophesy. Right? I wish everybody had the Spirit of the Lord. Right? And that, this event is a testimony to that. The fulfillment of Joel's prophecy is a testimony to Moses' words from Numbers chapter 11. And it is not just in the leadership circle, but it is amongst all of the people of Israel. All God's people would have his spirit, and all of them would be able to prophesy. And then we've got this uh, 17 and 18, this fruitful picture, the young men, old men, female servants, maid servants. So it's all people, sons, daughters, young, old, every class of society, that the spirit of God is not restricted to certain people or to certain roles, that the Holy Spirit is available to all people, to all flesh. Okay, so this is just another example of the future of the Gentiles being included. All flesh has this available to them. And then we see this symbolic picture coming up, this, the sun being turned to darkness and the earth or, or the, um, the moon turning to blood. And what do these kind of things mean, right, before the great magnificent day of the Lord? And because Peter has to get to this final phrase, Okay. The whole reason Peter lists all of this stuff is because he's going to get to the final line. What's the final line in this prophecy? Yeah, anybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, so that's where Peter's trying to get to. And so he's got to get to this kind of murky stuff, right? How can you say the sun and the moon, all this cosmic signs happen? Well, we have to be good ancient readers and bad modern-day readers, okay? Modern day wants to take everything and read it literally, right? We want to look at that and we want to say, okay, when is the sun going to eclipse and the moon? We're going to have a blood moon in the sky in the same day. You know, when is something like that? It's not what Peter's talking about. Peter, or Joel, was talking about metaphorical language, using metaphorical language to talk about uh, rulers and leaders, okay? When you think back to something like Genesis, where Joseph has a vision of himself being elevated to power, what does he see? He sees the sun, the moon, and the stars bowing down to him. And what does he understand that to be? His parents and his siblings. Okay, so this kind of authority figure image could be that parallel there. So the sun turning to darkness, the moon turning to blood, can just as easily be a picture of Jesus' crucifixion, where God the Father and turns away from the Son as he is crucified. You have this separation of Jesus and the Father as Jesus dies, right, and is resurrected. And Jesus as this reflection of the Father, the moon turning to blood in his crucifixion. So there's kind of these parallels there that lead to this connection then of the ultimate picture that, that it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So <clears throat> this is... Uh, this is where Peter's trying to get to, right? Um, this uh, day of the Lord, the one last thing about this prophecy, verse 20, the day of the Lord. That phrase, um, as you guys had read about in Amos, has two kind of meanings, right? Before Amos, everybody's like, the day of the Lord is so great, a day of salvation, right? And then Amos is like, don't desire the day of the Lord, it's dreadful and judgment, right? And what you begin to then is have a double presentation throughout the rest of the Old Testament. There is an element of God's salvation for the righteous and his judgment on the wicked. And that is the day of the Lord, right? And so what we have here then is the coming of the Spirit of God and God's splitting of people to say there will be people who reject him and people who choose him is a day of the Lord. So Pentecost, the, this filling of the Spirit, this um, redemption of the nations, Genesis chapter 11 reversal, is a day of the Lord. Okay, so how does he... How does he verify this? Well, he's going to look to the prophets and the Psalms. Okay, So Joel is the prophet, and then he's going to quote twice from the Psalms. 
uh, Psalm 16 and Psalm 110. And the two or the three Old Testament quotes in this speech are the central point of what Peter's trying to get at. So if these prophecies of Psalms and Joel have been fulfilled, then Jesus must have been resurrected and he must be at the right hand of God. And the reason you see the Holy Spirit coming is because he's there. Thus, anybody who calls on his name will be saved, just like Joel said, because the Holy Spirit is the evidence that he's at the right hand. Okay. So that's what Peter's trying to get at. Okay, so if you're if you're reading this passage and you're confused on the Psalm references or the Joel reference, uh, then you're going to be totally lost. Because those are the essence of what he says. Okay, and pretty much every preaching in the book of Acts, except Acts chapter 17, revolves around the Old Testament quotations. <clears throat> so, the signs of the Holy Spirit are the evidence that the resurrection has taken place, because they are fulfillments of Psalm 16 and Psalm 110. And if that is true, then anybody who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, this doesn't say Jesus, so who is the Lord? How do we know who the Lord is in this passage? Because none of these Old Testament passages say Jesus. It just says the Lord. Well, that's where Peter is saying that Jesus, in the end of his preaching, verse 36, he says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ this Jesus, whom you crucified. Okay. So each of these passages mention, mention the Lord. Anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 25, I saw the Lord always before me. Verse 34, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in my right hand. Okay. So each one of these passages points toward this idea then that Jesus has been made this Lord figure because he didn't see corruption, he resurrected, and the Holy Spirit has come. Quite a, quite a fun speech, I think. <clears throat> it's amazing. I mean, Luke does a great job at representing this speech to us so that everything so intricately is interwoven. So that each point builds off each other and then the whole thing circles back to the very first things that Peter says. So if you're a Jew listening to this, you have no choice but to respond. Either you're going to accept or you're going to reject. Right? That's the only two options. So what do the people say? What is their response? <clears throat> what can we do? What do we do now? Right? Their response isn't, how do we get saved? Right? Their response is not, how do we get saved? And Peter doesn't say to them, pray this prayer, invite Jesus into your heart. Right? What is Peter's response? Right, their, their response is so natural. If that is all true, if that's all true, like you're saying, then what do I do next? What am, what's expected of me? That's, their, that's the correct response. What is Peter's statement then to them that they must do after that? Repent, be baptized. Right? This is not like an invite Jesus to dwell in your heart like he's some poor beggar. Jesus has a home. He doesn't, he doesn't need you to invite him into your heart. He needs you to repent and make him Lord of your life, right? And so Peter says to them, repent. And that is an incredibly hard statement because repentance is the statement that says, I am wrong. Repentance is not feeling bad for your sin. Right? Repentance is not... I'm sorry. Repentance is a change of lifestyle, which naturally supposes and implies then for yourself, what I've been doing is incorrect and I must realign my life with what has just been said. And Peter says that's the only option. You can't just believe differently. In fact, Peter doesn't even say believe differently. He says live differently. 
And this is an important fact we'll talk about with religion as it comes up later on in this book, Greco-Roman religion, is that religion of the ancient world cared very, very little about what you believed, and it was all about what you did. The Greco-Roman gods were, there were so many different legends and myths and theories and things that nobody cared what you believed. It only mattered what you did for the gods. A lot of Jewish practice was based around the same type of thing in the ancient world. In fact, the word um, religio in Latin means scruples or duty before God. Right? So it's all about what they, what they did, how they lived their life. Um, godliness, piety are all action phrases for the Greeks of how they live their life, not what they believe. And so what Peter says is, what shall you do? You shall repent. And then you shall be baptized. And then receive. Right? None of these are things of what they need to believe. Not to discount belief. Okay, that's not what I, what I want to do right now. What I want to highlight is the importance of the action change of people's lives that the expectation of them coming to Christ was not just that they thought differently, but that they lived differently. One thing you will notice with the book of Acts is that baptism is central to gospel preaching and reception of Christ, because baptism was an outward display of commitment to Jesus. Nobody got baptized unless they have made Jesus Lord of their life. So it's not a flippant thing that people just do. This is an outward statement. I have died the death of Christ, and now I will live the life of Christ. Quite bold statements. So they've got to turn away from their actions, from their wrong thinking and their wrong life. <clears throat> they must be baptized, so they must make an outward choice of following Jesus. And the act of baptism is, is a full dunking of the individual into the water. And the image is that they have gone under the water and they have gone into the grave with Jesus Christ and then they are lifted up out of the water and that all of their sins have been washed away. The same as Jesus was resurrected to new life, so they have been resurrected out of the water to a new life. Right, so that's the, this image for them. And then to receive. In the same way that Israel received the law after their baptism through the Red Sea, so now... Peter is saying, receive the law written on your hearts after your baptism through water and you're dying the death of Christ and coming out to become a new people of God, a new family of God, living out in the promised land now that is here as they sojourn towards their future. So this is the call of, of Peter for the church. <clears throat> so when, when Peter goes on, it says that he continually exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. It's an interesting statement, right? Isn't Jesus the Savior? Isn't he the one that's supposed to save them? And this brings up an important point for salvation in the book of Acts and salvation in the New Testament. Does anybody know what the word saved is? Or in Greek, is this word sozo? Is this word saved? Does anybody know what else, like, how else this word is used? Have you heard anything about it? Okay. So, so, so we have saved or save. This is a, it's a verb. <clears throat> save. The, uh, I heard deliver. When you hear deliverance, what do you think of? Spiritual rescuing, right? Demons coming out of somebody. It's the most common what Christians think about. Okay. But the way that these words are used is, I think, because these become quite Christian, these words, save and deliver, right? Save from your ethereal sins to live in a this cosmic picture of divine, heavenly experience or deliverance from these cosmic powers or demonic powers. But probably the most tangible uh, translation is rescue. The, the word sozo, these words that, are, that we use in translating this idea of sozo, was a word that would be used if someone's drowning in the ocean. And they cry out, save me, deliver me, rescue me. That's the context of these words. 
Someone is in a perilous situation, and they are headed towards an imminent death, and they cry out, save me. That's what is in their mind. Okay? So when, when they use this word, they're taking the cultural context of saving, delivering, rescuing, and pulling that into a spiritual sense. Deliver yourself. Rescue yourself from this crooked generation. Because if you continue with this crooked generation, then you will surely die. That's his instructions. We'll see this, this word and idea come up many times in the book of Acts, and I'll highlight a number of them. But we see this fellowship of believers taking place um, in, the, in uh, Acts chapter 2, which is highlighted with a number of key points, which is, I think, um, pretty telling of the early church, um, is with this fellowship that they are devoted to the apostles' teaching, which probably the teaching of Jesus, following his ways, the kingdom of God, those types of things. Um, fellowship. The word koinonia, fellowship, is this deep personal connection. In fact, the word fellowship or the word koinonia has um, at times been used in classical Greek for intercourse, like sexual intercourse, um, but then was later on used for deep personal fellowship. And so this is a, a really intimate connection with the people around you, not in a sexual sense, but of course in an intimate friendship um, sense. There was the breaking of bread together, the eating of meals, but also this phrase is used uh, as a metaphor for the Eucharist, which is the body and blood of Christ. So they came together to share the Lord's table, another way of talking about it. And then prayer. Okay. These are some significant things for them. So teaching, the apostles' teaching, which is the Bible, they're gathering around the word of God, they're fellowshipping with one another, eating meals together, they're praying together, and they're sharing their possessions. Okay. Now, did, did everybody sell everything? Was this a, was a Christian communism? No. Because they still have homes to meet in, right? The, the word selling is an ongoing word, right? It implies this is an ongoing practice of the church, that when there was a need, they would sell. And that's what then you see at the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, when that's confronted with Ananias and Sapphira. You'll see this in Paul's letters. There's an ongoing practice of generosity. One of the interesting things is in the Western, the quote, Western world of the ancient world, and down through the ages, is that charity generosity and charity is not a cultural practice. That charity and the taking care of the poor was really most firmly developed by Christians. And it is only a rather modern invention in light of human history. And so that whole idea of Christians being charitable to other people is something that was only developed after the instigation of the church by Jesus Christ after his resurrection. Um, one of the interesting practices of the early church in light of this is that the outlined by an early church document called the Didache, which is the teaching of the Twelve, um, <clears throat> is that Christians are supposed to pra they're supposed to fast twice a week. The whole early church fasted twice a week. They fasted on Tuesdays and Fridays, and when they fasted, they would. Uh, they were supposed to save the money they would have spent on meals that day and find a poor person who can't buy their own food and give them money to buy their food. And that was the strict practice for the whole church in the early, um, in the early centuries of the church, just as a way of practicing generosity. So this kind of selling of the, uh, possessions for each other um, took root in the church and also um, outside of it. So the, we see that awe came on every soul, and that uh, people were amazed at the Christians. Now, how were they seeing them? Where were they meeting? Well, they were probably meeting at the Temple Mount. It seems that the church was probably gathering at Solomon's Colonnade, which is where uh, the preaching of Peter is going to take place in Acts chapter 3, after the healing of the, uh, the beggar. Uh, they go together into Solomon's Colonnade, which was probably where they were meeting, or... Uh, in the upper room, but being that there were potentially thousands of people now, um, the Temple Mount makes the most sense for a large gathering place for a lot of people. So Solomon's Colonnade is this here. That's what most people think is Solomon's Colonnade is this large one here that's out of the picture, but it's um, you can see these pillared rows and a covering over. That would have been the same thing under here. So same kind of deal. <clears throat> 
So the beautiful gate healing in chapter 3 takes place at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. It says it's the ninth hour. It was 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And beggars were a very common sight at the temple. Okay. Um, in fact, Josephus tells us that the beggars at the temple were probably well off. That the pious Jews coming to the temple to give their money and offer sacrifices were incredibly generous because they believed that their piety would earn them favor with God. And so the beggars probably did pretty well for themselves at the temple. And that when Peter and John come to this beggar, that the beggar assumes already, right? Of course, he's gonna, they're going to give us some money, silver or gold, um, when he's coming to them. Uh, just so we have kind of an idea here. Uh, this is the beautiful gate. So it leads right into the temple precincts. Okay. So this is the, the temple mount. This is the sanctuary. This is the... Um, uh, outer court, or uh, court of the, the women, court of Israel, uh, and you have the beautiful gate here, which is the main entrance in there, right? <clears throat> uh, Fortress Antonia, I don't know if anybody has talked about that, but the Fortress Antonia was built in the corner of the Temple Mount so that the Romans could look into the Temple Mount, and if there was riots or anything, they could see it happening, and that's why the Tribune comes to rescue Paul, because he's probably looking through the windows at what's going on inside the temple. <clears throat> so Peter and John um, come to this man, and uh, they lock eyes with the, the beggar, and they see this, this gaze. And there's um, multiple times in this book where there is a a moment of somewhat of a miracle happening after someone is, has this kind of intense gaze at another person. Um, you can just pay, pay attention. It comes up a couple of times. Um, I don't have any specific significance with that other than the repetition I find interesting in the scenario. But this man um, who had been paralyzed is lifted up. Okay. And <clears throat> the... The astounding thing, of course, for everybody is he's been lame from birth, okay? So he's been paralyzed from the day he was born, and we're going to find out later that he was more than 40 years old, okay? So everybody knows this guy. It's not like some random dude who just showed up yesterday at the temple and Peter and John heal him. This is like the most significant testimony they could have had. This guy who's been there forever, he has been lame since birth. It's not like he walked once, and now he's just been kind of a... Uh, uh, mooching off of people's generosity because he just lays on the ground. But he's actually never been able to walk. So it's a super significant healing for everybody. But <clears throat> what this then will lead to with people, um, with the crowds, is this willingness to hear from Peter again. Okay, so he's, when, when Peter preaches the second time, okay, this is a, a timeline of events, okay? So he goes into the, the beautiful gate. This man gets healed. And then Peter and John probably go about their business. Because he gets healed at the beautiful gate, but it's not until Solomon's portico across the Temple Mount where they're going to preach at. Okay? So chances are they went around, they went into the temple because it says they were going up to the temple at the time. They finished their business in the temple, whether that was offering a sacrifice or whether it was giving money. We do know that the Jews, even after the resurrection of Jesus, continued to practice their cultural practices of Judaism. And we see that with James and um, instructing Paul to offer an offering, shave his head, offer the necessary sacrifices. Okay? So we see them um, continuing to do that. So Peter and John go up to the temple, they finish whatever they're doing, and then they leave and go to Solomon's portico. And by that time, there is gathered an enormous crowd. And we're going to know that after this event, 5,000 people are going to be a part of this movement now. Okay, so another 2,000 have joined in from Pentecost after this healing with this beggar. So, <clears throat> when Peter stands up to preach, we get a number of significant things in this message as well. Okay, so he's going to preach another message with a lot of Old Testament connections, but he's not going to make as many references like he did before explicitly. So how does he open this, this statement or this preaching? Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this or why do you stare at us 
as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. So that, that first instance, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, where else has that come up? Did Jesus say this before? In Luke chapter 20, verse 37, Jesus brings up this same quotation from the book of Exodus only a couple months earlier in the same location at the Temple Mount. And this reference is back to Exodus 3, 6. This is the burning bush moment. This is the moment where God reveals his identity to Moses by the name that he had never been known before. And that's what uh, Luke is going to go on, or Peter goes on to say in this speech, right, is that he, right, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus. Okay? Now, that then points towards the actions of God in this moment. So this word for servant, or the idea for servant here, is significant. This is the first time Jesus will be called a servant in the book of Acts. And the word that's used specifically is this Greek word, pice. And this is the same word that's used in the book of Isaiah, specifically in chapter 52, verse 13, where it talks about a suffering servant. This is that amazing passage of the suffering servant who comes and, you know, is of um, no, nothing to behold, but lays down his life and is beaten and broken for the sins of the nations and um, it's the beautiful passage that's going to come up again with the Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8. Okay. But what, what Luke, or what Peter's thinking of here is this, this servant, uh, Jesus, is that he is now fitting into the role of Isaiah's servant. Why is that significant? Because the people of Israel thought they were that suffering servant. So the way that uh, Israel was reading the servant passages at the time is that they were the suffering servant that would bring the, the nations in, right? Or that they would be the ones who'd been beaten and broken by the nations to um, ultimately fulfill God's plan. So they thought they were the servant. Now you have Peter saying Jesus is that servant, and he fulfilled the role that all of you failed to do, essentially, right? Because a lot of Jesus' ministry was the fulfillment of Israel's ministry where they had failed over and over and over. That's the whole point of the 40 years or 40 days in the wilderness is a redemption of those 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Okay, so Jesus brings this fulfillment. Now, that's made even more specific because you might just say, okay, well, servant of God. A lot of people are servants of God. Paul refers to himself as a servant of God. But then he goes on to make this statement about the name of him. He says, but you denied the Holy and Righteous One. Now, both of these in Greek are substantives, which means that they could be easily translated the Holy One and the Righteous One. Okay? So, in, in the original Greek, it just reads, uh, <clears throat> but you denied the Holy and Righteous and asked for a man or a murder to be granted to you. Right? So, it's translated the Holy and Righteous One. You guys remember Isaiah? Remember one of the most favorite terms of Isaiah to refer to the God of Israel? comes from Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6, he hears the song of heaven, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And from then on, pretty much Isaiah refers to Yahweh as the Holy One of Israel. And so what Peter's saying here is he's calling and equating Jesus with the Holy One of Israel from Isaiah. Okay? That is an enormous statement, considering the fact that Isaiah was one of the most significant prophets uh, at this time for them. Right, so we get a number of references in Isaiah, and then this is also going to be a favorite phrase in the book of Acts. Luke is going to use this phrase, the Holy One, multiple times in the book of Acts to reference to God. And so Peter is making this clear connection between Yahweh and Jesus and equating them the same. So this goes back to in his first speech where he's referring to Jesus as Lord, and that Lord or Adonai, um, kurios, is only used of Yahweh. So he's making these very, very clear 
not only divine connections, but messianic connections as well for Jesus. <clears throat> so the first paragraph really lays out how this miracle could happen because of who Jesus was and where his power came from. Okay. Because he's from God, he's God's servant, but he's also the Holy One and Righteous One of Israel. And that comes back to then the revelation of him being connected with the, uh, their ancestors of the burning bush experience. But then the second paragraph, the next major portion of this speech, will get into the witness of God's messengers throughout history and how the prophets have testified to this one to come. Moses, most specifically, okay, Israel's greatest prophet. Okay, if, you, if you don't remember that, Moses is referred to as Israel's greatest prophet. Moses is considered a prophet, really Israel's first prophet, and their greatest. Moses does more miracles than anybody in the Bible except for Jesus. He has arguably the most important impact upon uh, history for God's people except for Jesus. And so they really, they elevated him as this, this primary figure in their history. And then what Peter is going to quote is a passage from Deuteronomy where Moses says, there will come one after me who is greater than I am, and you must listen to him, and if you don't, then you'll be cut off from God's people. And so Peter makes a very, very clear connection. The prophet that Moses was talking about is Jesus. And if you don't listen to him, then you'll be cut off. And then he'll go on to say that every prophet after that has confirmed this. And thus, he leaves them with no excuse. If you actually believe God's word, and you actually take it as authoritative, you cannot deny who Jesus is. And these kind of statements in Acts 1, or sorry, Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 7, with the speech of Stephen, are what help us to understand statements like in Acts chapter 9, where it says that Paul was in the synagogue convincing people that Jesus was the Christ. That through these kind of speeches, there's no denial. Either you deny or you accept. There is no other option. There's no debate. It's either denial or acceptance. What is Peter's call to his listeners? What does he call them to? Repentance. The same thing that he called the, the people listening at Pentecost. And this is a key part of all gospel preaching because repentance acknowledges, again, that somebody is wrong in their life and they need to realign themselves with Jesus. <clears throat> you know, Jesus would always meet people where they're at, but he would never allow someone to stay where they're at. He met people in the midst of their sin and he would always tell them, go and sin no more. He never said, it's okay. Just keep on trying. No, he, he always meets people where they're at, and then he calls them higher. And one of the greatest disservices that we can do to anybody is to make them think that God is okay with their lifestyle before Jesus. His call is always to turn away from wickedness and turn towards righteousness. And that goes down to our time now, that we must do the same thing. And God, you know, he loves people where they are before they know Christ, but he does not love people as they are. Otherwise, they wouldn't need a savior. God is calling everybody to repentance who has not been walking with him. And some people who claim to have been walking with him are also going to be called to repentance. The Revelation, each uh, five of the seven churches in Revelation who are followers of Jesus, five of them are called to repentance. And so it's not just a, a one-time thing. Sometimes it needs to be something that we continue to walk in. But one thing we just have to be careful with is preaching a gospel that makes people think that God's okay with their sin or that somehow their lifestyle is acceptable to him when it's not. 
And it is, I think it's just something we need to be aware of and think about in our own gospel preaching. Because we want to give people the whole message. And the one thing, you know, I think sometimes we're just maybe afraid of being rejected by people. But Jesus was never afraid of being rejected. God is not afraid of being rejected. Jesus knew there were people who wouldn't agree with him. John chapter 6, where he says all of these difficult things, and then so many, it doesn't say the crowd, it says so many disciples left him. And then Jesus turns to the 12 and says, are you going to leave also? Like, Jesus doesn't need the affirmation of man. Right? It's not like a some, you know, if a maybe a modern pastor would be in that same situation and he says something that confuses a ton of people and they start to leave the church. He goes, wait, 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 that's not what I meant. Please come back. I'll explain it to you. Jesus is like, see you later. You know, if people are not going to accept the message of Jesus, that's on them, not on him. And what Paul says in 1 Corinthians is that it is not by the preaching of the individual that a person is saved. It is by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And that no matter how bad someone preaches, the conviction of the Spirit can still be on them. The first person I ever led to the Lord, I was like, I shared the gospel with them. And I was like, so do you, do you want to give your life to Jesus? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, really? Like, that was, <laughs> like are, you, are you sure? Like, are you sure you want to do that? Because it was so bad. But the conviction of the Spirit was on them, and they, they wanted to give their life to Christ. And, and thankfully, we were able to plug them into a church and get them connected with a good group of believers. I, I was so young, I had no idea what I was doing. But it is, it's the conviction of the Spirit of God. right? And that is the most important element. right? But we have to be faithful to give the whole message of Jesus. Right? And to help people see their, their need for Him. So, Let's uh, look at chapter 4, I think, real quick, and then we'll finish up for the day. That'll get us at a good stopping point, I think. So chapter 4, we open up um, Peter, right? They've been, they're being brought in before the high priest and the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, Pharisees, um, <clears throat> that group. And, uh, or they're, sorry, they're arrested and uh, spend one night in jail, and then they're brought before the council. And... <clears throat> The high priestly family at this time um, is like all over the place. Yeah, uh, it's very corrupt. I mean, maybe you guys have learned about the high priestly family situation, but basically it was bought and sold and really was owned by one family at this time. And so it's the house of Annas that is in control of the high priesthood and the priestly class uh, in the city of Jerusalem. So it's really only people from his family that are high priests. And so you have Annas, who is high priest from 6 to 15 AD. And he's the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest at Jesus' trial. Annas is, if you think of him, he's like the, he's the high priest godfather. Everybody is in submission to him. He's in control of the whole priestly family. And he is the head of all of the corruption. Caiaphas um, was his son-in-law, married to Annas' daughter, and he was high priest from A.D. 18 to 36. And then um, that's who then, of course, he's here, right? They're brought before the high priest, um, Caiaphas and Annas. So when it, in verse um, 6 of chapter 4, it says, With Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, who all uh, and all who are of the high priestly family. Okay, so... While it refers to Annas as the high priest, he's not technically the acting high priest at this time, but he's still alive and he's like the godfather, so he has the title. Um, and then you have Ananias, who's going to then be a part of this family as well. He'll be high priest from AD 47 to 58. So these are the three people who are going to come up as figures as high priests in this book. And so they ask, you know, how is this man healed? And, and Peter explains very clearly. You know, and what the high priestly family is trying to do, is they're, they're trying to keep this all hidden and hush-hush, right? They're trying to keep everybody from figuring out what's going on. And Peter, just like Jesus before the high priestly family, is bold and honest. He's like, I'm going to tell you the truth. You know, I'm not going to keep anything from you. This is a strong contrast to Peter's hiddenness when he's denying Jesus. 
Because when he's bef uh, outside of the house of Annas and Caiaphas, you guys remember that? Okay. Jesus' trial is very small. When Jesus is brought to the house of Annas and Caiaphas, it is probably from the courtyard of his house is from here to the rest of the room. Okay? It's small. 30 people in there are standing pretty shoulder to shoulder. Peter is right outside, probably where Alexander is. Jesus, near the front, can look and see Peter across the courtyard. He's, he's less than 100 feet away from him. Okay? And at that time, Peter is denying Jesus. And now he's standing before those same people that he watched condemn Jesus. And he's standing boldly, openly, basically um, <clears throat> uh, confronting them of their wickedness. And what does he say? You know, he says, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Verse 11, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you the builders, which has become the cornerstone. I don't know if you guys have the quote there uh, in your verse, but uh, that comes from Psalm 118, verse 22. It's not in my footnotes. So Psalm 118, 22 is where Acts uh, 411 comes from. And so that, I, I can't think of a more bold statement to make to the leaders of the nation. You reject it. Jesus, who has become the cornerstone, which was understood to be a messianic prophecy. Okay. So this is, he, he's saying, you know, the Messiah, you have rejected, the leaders have rejected him. And then in verse 12, and there is salvation by no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Okay, so we get that, that idea, sozo, so this salvation, rescue, deliverance, and their response is, of course, would be like, what do we need to be saved from? We're following Yahweh. We're faithfully walking with him. We don't need to be saved from anything. So the implications for Peter is that when he says there's no other name by which we must be saved, he's saying you're not saved. You are currently in the wickedness of this world and you need deliverance. And that's his statement to them. And what they observe is that they are ordinary and uneducated. Now, that observation doesn't come from their speech. It comes from their, their um, like communication, like not the topics of their communication, but their presentation of communication. Okay? What this means is not that they were dumb. Okay? This doesn't mean all oh, these dumb fishermen from Galilee. No, what it means is they didn't have formal rabbinic training. Because like I said, pretty much every Jewish male is taught to read and write. Okay, so Peter, John, James, all the apostles probably could read and write. So it has nothing to do with their intelligence. It has to do with formal rabbinic training. And what the Pharisees recognize is that their, their rabbinic training didn't come from the formal schools. It came from Jesus Christ or Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the son of Joseph. Okay, that's where it came from. So that's what they recognize with him. Here, a lot of people um, use this to maybe dismiss having good training, but uh, it's not what it's all about. So <clears throat> their response, of course, right, this is don't go on preaching this name and this famous line of, you know, we're only going to do what God says to do. We're not going to listen to you. And if God tells us to go on and preach, we're going to do it. We're going to be faithful to God, not faithful to you. And, of course, they're speaking a message that the leaders don't want to hear. And their ears are closed, just like you find the leaders at the end of the book of Acts, when Paul is speaking to them. Acts 28, the leaders' ears are closed there. And they, what you see then is Peter and John and the other apostles are going to be like the Old Testament prophets. It doesn't matter what you tell us, or if you tell us to stop, we have to preach the word of God. We have to tell the truth. Even if the people are hard-hearted, they have a stone heart, they're still going to preach the truth to them. 
And so what we see then is this uh, instruction not to preach. And so they go out finding no other way to punish them. Um, but they are threatened. Okay, So they threaten them with some kind of violence. But they don't punish them in that moment. That will come later. But as they go out, the, the church begins to rejoice. Okay. They're, they're praising what had happened. Not just the healing, but the fact that they are being threatened for Jesus. And then they're going to rejoice later on when they face physical violence. So why? Why do they rejoice at this? Why is this something that is um, a moment of uh, rejoicing for them? Well, one of the early church perspective was that when the church suffered, that they get to joyfully enter the sufferings of Christ. And what they looked at is that the sufferings of Christ for them was the greatest act of love that Jesus had ever shown, is that he was willing to suffer and die. And what the early church began to view about this, their own sufferings is that it was the greatest gift that they could give to Jesus and their greatest moment of intimacy with Christ this side of eternity was when they could do for Jesus what he did for them. And that will come up many times. In fact, suffering and persecution is one of the most common themes in the New Testament. It comes up in nearly every single book. <clears throat> and the, the picture that we have here is, is, I think, is an interesting one, you guys, because of how they respond. You know, when we think about this and, and think about being outcasts or being different from society, people are thinking, you know, you know, Christians are weird and what they believe is weird and uh, they're so intolerant and um, all that kind of stuff. And really the reality that is is that we should, as Christians, feel weird compared to the world. We should not feel at home in the ways of the world. The lifestyle of the world, the situations, the things they watch, the things they listen to, the things that the world talks about. We should feel weird being in that because that is not who we are. And if we're not accepted by society because of what we believe and because of what we stand for, then that is fine. Jesus promised that we would have people who hate us just like he did. And what the church does is they count it joy when they get to suffer on behalf of Christ. And so the church begins to continues to grow, and the people stand in awe of the church because of their response and because of the growth in the face of persecution. And <clears throat> what you see in their prayer, because right, they come back to the church, they pray, and then the room is shaken, and the Holy Spirit fills that place again. Their prayer has nothing to do with asking God for the leaders to die horribly. You know, would you just get rid of them? It doesn't say, you know, stop. Or can you make them not be so mean to us, you know, or protect us? Don't, they don't ask for the persecution to stop. They don't even ask for the authorities to be converted so they can freely preach the gospel. Instead, what they say is, look at their threats and let us go on speaking boldly and continue to work in power. Right. Their prayer is, look at, the, look at the things they're doing, look at the things they're saying, and let us be bold. And what, they, what it looks at is, you know, the opposition is there, and God knows about them. And the church is here, and we have got to be faithful to continue to speak of Jesus boldly and confidently. And it is an important testimony for us. So, with that, let me pray. We'll be here for today. Lord, thank you so much for the book of Acts. Just, God, how inspiring it is. Lord, how challenging it is for us. I pray, Lord, that as we get into this book, God, would you convict us, Holy Spirit? Would you prompt us to be your witnesses, Lord, in every way that we can? Lord, that we would be faithful in sharing. God, we be faithful in telling people about you, Lord, and that we would let nothing hold us back, God, but we continue to be bold and confident in our declaration of what you have done and who you are. And Lord, I pray that you, your Holy Spirit, would remind us, prompt us, help us to preach a gospel that is the whole picture that you, of who you are and what you've done, and what you've called us to. 
We thank you so much, God, for this time. I pray you bless this class in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.